Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Brawley City Council and successor agency to the Brawley Community Redevelopment Agency. Special meeting agenda for Tuesday, November 6th at 2 p.m. We can have the roll call, please. Look, the minutes will reflect all council members present. Thank you. <laughs> the invocation by council member Sam Couchman. Lord, we thank you for being with us during this meeting and all the people in attendance here. We ask for your protection for our armed services personnel, both overseas and here in this country. Uh, we, we ask for your guidance during this meeting for the good of the city of Brawley. Amen. 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 Thank you. Our Pledge of Allegiance by our city manager, Rosanna Bayonne Moore. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as written? So moved. There's a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item two, public appearances and comments. Not to exceed four minutes. This is a time for the public to address the council on any item not appearing on the agenda that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. The mayor will recognize you when you come to the microphone. Please state your name for the record. You are not allowed to make personal attacks on individuals or make comments which are slanderous or which may invade an individual's personal privacy. Please direct your questions and comments to the City Council. Is there anyone here who would like to make a public comment? Mello. All right. Sorry, I'm excited. Excited, uh, all right. It's a good thing. Um, the Veterans Committee that is in charge of the Memorial Wall uh, met this morning and um, ratified what they're going to be doing actually on November 11th, which is Sunday. Um, normally we would have an evening program, et cetera, but because it's uh, cattle call rodeo and those kinds of things they've tailored back on what they're going to do so they're partner partnering with a group who physically walk from Westmoreland to Brawley on the morning of the 11th on Sunday they they meet at Motel 6 because different people walk at different paces and if I was walking they'd wait a long time but that's beside the point um, and then they walk together and what they're going to do is come down to our memorial wall and at 11 o'clock, we're going to have a very short ceremony that will have taps, which always makes me cry, um, a prayer, and um, a salute to the flag. And then the people who have walked from Westmoreland will be going across the street, and the local American Legion will be feeding them lunch. So I wanted to invite everybody to be there just, just at 11. It's going to be very, very short, very sweet. Um, we're not, they don't even want chairs or anything. If somebody wants a chair, bring a chair. Um, but that's what they're going to do this year. They're also going to participate in the um, rodeo at 1 o'clock um, and be recognized as veterans. Right. So they'll be riding in a Dodge Ram truck because Dodge is a sponsor of the rodeo. Very welcome. So I just Thank wanted to give you an update. Thank you for the update. And the invitation. Thank you very Marjo, much. Marjo, is that on the first day of the rodeo that they're participating? No, it's on the second day on Sunday the Sunday. 11th. Okay. Armistice Day okay. was originally on 11-11 at 11 a.m., so that's why they went ahead, and that works with the time with what they're doing. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who'd like to make a public appearance or has a comment for the city council? Good afternoon. Uh, Marty Coyne. Uh, here regarding Latical Ranch. Um, I know you got a busy schedule today, so the only part I wanted to come by is, is uh, as I had mentioned to most of you guys in some individual meetings we've had, time is critical. Um, I, October 31st, passed my due diligence, and we have a commitment with the seller to close escrow by November 15th. In discussion with him, the sellers, the other day, uh, they were open to a 30-day extension, providing I come back and give them a date that I can meet with the city manager and kind of iron out last little wrinkles, hopefully, of putting together a development agreement. 
and actually have a council date, whether it's a special date or a, the next one coming up, uh, they would allow me to extend to December 15th. But uh, I think I've led all along for whatever reason. They've given me some pretty tight timelines. Your city manager's been obviously very occupied in your, your audits and budgets, and so we uh, have not been able to connect in the last two, three weeks uh, at least. Um, I've had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about Raleigh, getting to know yourselves, uh, a little bit more about the project. Uh, I've definitely appreciated your time uh, and also other opportunities in the city of Raleigh, whether it's retail and not only just doing Latical Ranch. So really, again, I know you have a busy schedule today. If I could walk out of here with some sort of commitment on a person-to-person on -person with the city manager and get put on a city council date, I think we can continue that closing date uh, with the seller to December 15th. Um, and hopefully, uh, and I really believe we're down to probably two or three items, or possibly four, uh, to maybe put together this ladder code development agreement and move forward. Uh, we do have some work to do, obviously, with the city manager and staff. Obviously, you guys are aware that we're working on without trying to get IID on board to help underground that canal that seems to be important to the city and many other things. Um, but we're still anxious to get involved. But I think when we lose that timeline, um, then it's going to be over. And who knows? As you know, Latico Ranch has been sitting for 13 years. I'm sure the city council doesn't want to sit for another 10 or 13 years. We are prepared to move forward. We are prepared to develop it. We have the financial resources. It's just a matter of connecting with council now and, and at least the city manager and try to get on board with staff, which has been kind of a struggle. Um, um, but, but, but we are the real thing and we're ready to go. We just, at this timeline, I'm not so sure I can squeak out of that. Um, so is it possible today that we can either uh, uh, have council work with me to be able to go back to the sellers with a commitment on a date to come before you. And, and, uh, and, and you said you have uh, on through the 15th of December, you said, right? <laughs> well, right. it's November right now, and I uh, had dialogue with him over the weekend, uh, Mr. Mark McMillan, the principal himself, and, um, and I kind of got built in a 30-day extension, but I don't the, believe the first meeting further than that. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the first meeting in December is the four, is that the fourth? Well, you got, you got to keep in mind though. One thing is is be, be, be prior to closing escrow, we'd have to get council to vote on a development agreement and then have legal draw up a de development agreement, which would take time and get it ratified. Um, so we definitely got to do it way in advance of that. Uh, in order yeah, to yeah, yeah. November 20th. Just as a, a point of reference, it might be helpful to council. So we're not clear yet whether there's a condition modification that's being sought or just it's a development agreement that's consistent with the existing conditions of approval. And I can help you on that. Um, if it's simply a development agreement to prepare for the council's action and, and there is no um, <coughs> changes to the conditions of approval that are associated with the mapping activity, that's one pathway. But it, it is not clear yet whether there is a condition change being sought and staff has um, requested respectfully of the developer to place in writing what his requests are. I believe a courtesy copy, copy has been provided to you. Uh, Mr. Coyne has an op had an opportunity to meet both with me uh, along with the city engineer and uh, development services director, and then have follow-up uh, with those two as well. And as of Friday, unfortunately, after 4 p.m., I wasn't available. I was trying to get the agenda out, so that was okay. the last meeting request that we had. And I'm really sorry I couldn't stretch but, but it any thinner to. But, but I'll, I'll clarify meet you it though, as I have with everybody. There are some conditions that we're asking to be modified. So, so to kind of summarize it for you, the whole subdivision conditions had 29 conditions. I, as the buyer, uh, agree to 21 of them. Seven of those we're asking for slight amendments or clarifications on. We have asked and staff has kind of already agreed to eliminate one of them. And then there's four new additions just to get clarifications of, of how do we get to where we need to be without leaving the city open with a checkbook or I open as a developer as a checkbook. And we've kind of shared those in that same letter that you were in response back to in writing. I was out for a few days on medical, as you know, and then, of course, you've been tied up with audits. But, but, but again, it's not me or you controlling the timeline. It's the seller. And I just don't know how important Latico is to the city to get rolling. I really believe that we can get to where we need to be to get things rolling. Again. Um, I'm certainly never hoping to be the delay to any uh, developer. Uh, I believe your last request of me was not to prepare a written response, that Correct. you wanted to revise your request to the city, and I have yet to receive your 
your rewritten request? Well, I, I think as, as we lose one or two weeks at a time or even l longer and, and back and forth in the mail, that the goal was to meet with you as a city manager one-on-one, -on -one, one or two hours it can be resolved or we can agree to agree. You've already pointed out you didn't have the authority regarding some conditions, mm -hmm. and, and so we knew it would have to be council action anyway. So that one or two hours would help you and I finalize and really just nail it down to maybe one or two, three items that would have to go before council, and mm -hmm. it would either be a kill dead deal or it would be approved by council, and we'd move on and look forward to development. So I, I know we're not agendized for today, yeah. but no. it may be helpful for council to be aware the one condition that's in play is probably the one of greatest significance to the surrounding area residents mm -hmm. as well as to the city of Brawley, and it represents one of the most costly improvements that remain on the site. Um, because I don't know whether it will take the form of condition modification or simply different timing arrangements in the development agreement, if it's a condition modification, uh, staff's recommendation would be to give it some time in front of the Planning Commission and then come to the Council so that the community can have a chance to, to have some awareness of the issue. And uh, we would also want to work with legal counsel on whether we're obligated to do so, which mm -hmm. hasn't been clear yet because we weren't sure of what the actual right. request is. So, so just to move this forward, uh, yes. th there's limited time. This is a public appearance and not an agenda mm -hmm. item. But if you could please uh, find some time to meet with Mr. Coyne, mm -hmm. we'd appreciate that. And then we can uh, see if uh, we can introduce the topic. If there is some agreement, we can see it on the next uh, council agenda, and that's the 20th. Is that... I think that the I next that council agenda is a 20. I right. it's, a tight, I, it's, it's going to be very challenging for staff to focus on I understand. budget preparation. But at the just time at the very least, have the conversation so we understand we where we're at. Sure. Yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. If we have right. special Thank you. Yeah. Right. Is there anyone else who'd like to make a public appearance or has a comment? We have some time. <coughs> Seeing none, uh, we'll move forward with consent agenda. Items are approved by one motion. Council members or members of the public may request consent items be considered separately at a time determined by the mayor. Is there a motion to approve the consent as written? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next is regular business for a discussion potential action to approve first reading of ordinance number 2018, ordinance of the City Council of the City of Brawley, California, establishing installation of stop signs at the intersection of Cesar Chavez Street and River Drive. Backup materials on pages 72 to 75. It's going to be presented by our city engineer. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, Guillermo Sillas, Public Works Director. As you have on your materials, uh, this item um, is being reviewed because uh, the history of uh, accidents on these uh, two um, streets intersection, Cesar Chavez and River Drive, and most recently uh, the accident uh, by a speeding vehicle that hit uh, one power pole uh, that uh, led to uh, drag uh, almost two or three more. Uh, uh, posing a significant risk and uh, we got some calls from residents uh, uh, asking for uh, to do some type of uh, change at that intersection. Uh, they even uh, asked for um, speed bumpers uh, but we believe that uh, and, and we shared this among the, the traffic safety committee uh, members and uh, so we uh, <coughs> think that uh, installing stop signs, not saying that it will prevent somebody from speeding, right? But at least uh, there's a, a legal reference to say that it was um, indicated to stop at this intersection. And, uh, and also we installed uh, barricades to try to protect those power poles from uh, another accident. Okay. And what you have uh, before you is uh, the decision or an, an item to um, see if uh, you are willing to allow to uh, modify the, or the speed ordinance and to allow the installation of those stop signs at both uh, directions. And I think uh, the last uh, occurrence, October 13th, I, I did receive a message from a member of the public and I forwarded that message over to city staff. And so, and I did speak to the member of the public regarding that particular instance and um, looks like there's been four accidents in the past uh, three years so okay mr. mayor I move to approve the 
the ordinance uh, with those changes to establishing stop signs at the intersection of Cesar Chavez Street and River Drive. A motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second the item. Is there a discussion on the topic? Any questions? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much for the Thank report. You. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is regular business. 4B, discussion potential action to adopt resolution number 2018, resolution of the City Council of the City of Raleigh declaring an emergency to ratifying action taken by the City Manager and approving emergency purchase of a sewage pump of sewage pumps for lift station number 3 in the amount of $20,165.85 from Xylene Water Solutions USA, back of materials on page 76 through 79. This is a ratifying action, so I'll make the motion to approve the item. Is there a second? Second. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion or any questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, regular business 4C, discussion potential action to award contract for project number 2018-06, line center pool, heater, and CO2 upgrades to NOR systems in the amount of $77,225 and authorize a 10% contingency backup materials on pages 80 and 81. And that will be presented by Guillermo as well. Yes, uh, me again, uh, Mr. Mayor. So this project, it is uh, for the replacement of the pool heaters and CO2 tank for um, the pool. And we received uh, just one bid uh, from a distributor. And uh, uh, so we believe that is uh, reasonable. And uh, since it's the just one bid that we receive, and, and so we are asking for approval, um, this manufacturer, well, they are distributor and manufacturer too. They, in preliminary conversations, they said that they could achieve the installation in much less than anticipated. We, we uh, preliminary uh, said that will be about three months because the lead time is between six and eight weeks. And uh, they confirm that they have in stock the, the, the equipment, so they could install probably in four weeks. Good. Well, so I, it will be much faster. That's uh, the advantage of uh, this company. Good. All right, so uh, there's an item on the agenda. Is there a motion to approve this item? So move, make a motion. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, discussion potential action to approve a contract with Lee and Rowe, Inc. in the amount of $127,061 for emergency design services of two, of two sedimentation basins components to be replaced at the City of Brawley Water Treatment Plant. Backup materials on pages 82 to 100. And Guillermo is up again. Again? Yes. Yes. Um, this project, it is uh, being proposed uh, as an emergency. Uh, the replacement of uh, or rehabilitation of this uh, part of the uh, water treatment plant, among other components, has been in the queue for some years. But recently, the sedimentation basin experienced uh, problems to the point that, they, that the operators had to stop uh, the operation of the plant. Fortunately, we have uh, storage tanks and, and ponds to store uh, water. But uh, since uh, these components of the sedimentation basin are very old, and they pass the useful life already, so they have to assemble or deassemble uh, the west side uh, pond to uh, try to fix just one pond, plus approximately 10% of the new stock uh, parts that they had uh, on the plant. And, and they were able to make uh, one uh, pond uh, uh, operational. At the same time, they ordered some uh, parts, uh, just uh, a portion of the parts that are required for the full uh, rehabilitation. So we, uh, we are uh, in risk with uh, this plant 
or these basins uh, operating one pond with uh, used components and the other one waiting to receive uh, some portion of the parts. Since this project has been in the queue for a while, so w we are at the point that the plan, you know, uh, is no longer uh, working the, without this rehabilitation. So that's the reason that uh, we believe that is very important in, in the, to move forward with this project. But we need uh, plans and specifications to be able to uh, make sure that we will receive what we need. We obtain some quotes from uh, manufacturers and contractors, uh, but uh, w the, the item before you is uh, to engage or, or authorize to engage uh, this company, but knowing that in the near future, so we will be in construction phase, uh, most likely uh, treating it uh, as an emergency. Of course, that we need to clarify that uh, with legal counsel and uh, with uh, the counsel to be on board of uh, to move uh, this way, bypassing the procurement process. So uh, this item tonight is just to approve uh, the design with uh, Lee and Rowe, which is a company that has uh, a lot of experience in the industry and also uh, know our system uh, very much. So that's the reason to move forward. They are available, they are capable, they can uh, start uh, as soon as we approve or provide a notice to proceed. So that's uh, the, the reason to move uh, this project with uh, Lee and Rowe. Very well. Uh, I'll just open it up for discussion uh, with council. Any questions on this particular topic? I know we discussed um, the water treatment facility multiple times in the past. We realize it's um, nearly 20 years old, so, uh, you know, it's obviously heavy use. Um, any questions on this topic? Just a comment, Mr. Mayor, and then again, I think emphasizing not just the information in our backup, but this is, as is, is, um, Guillermo has pointed out, it has been in the queue. We know it's been an issue. Um, and in a lot of ways, we've probably been fortunate we've made it this far. Um, without having to address it, hence now we're in a little bit more of an emergency <coughs> situation. So um, I, I would think this is obviously something we need to move forward with. So be my statement. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion to approve the item? So moved. There's a motion to approve the item. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion or questions? Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 4E, but I'm going to skip that and move to departmental reports, and we're going to get through the rest of the agenda with the exception of closed, and then we'll go back to E. So departmental reports, please. 5A, monthly staff report prepared by Shirley Bonillas. I'm Rolando, Council, Council Member Shirley Bonillas, Personnel and Risk Management. Page 101 is the November report. We remain with four police officers opening. There has been no changes. <coughs> we still have cattle call temp help included in the summary. Very well. Any Always questions? We'll answer your questions. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, th there's also on item 6A is just a record of building permits for September 2018. If there's any questions from council. Um, otherwise, uh, the report's in the back. And we'll move on to City Council Member Reports, and we'll start with uh, Council Member Hamby. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I <coughs> attended the uh, cattle call mixer out at Chabela's last night. It was well attended. A lot of cars there. Uh, I attended a swearing-in this morning of a, of a new reserve officer for Brawley PD. Uh, over the past week or so, I've, I've uh, met with some concerned citizens regarding regarding some park equipment, some playground equipment, and um, also regarding uh, a stop sign placement, some uh, concerned moms wanting to change out some yield signs on Western and like BC area uh, for stop signs and uh, because of a lot of pedestrian traffic uh, during school hours. So I'll, I'll be talking uh, some about that with the city manager in the near future. Um, and that's that's it for my report. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Kastner-Houdegui. 
Okay, um, I attended the annual um, MANA gala where they uh, honor various women in the community, uh, three women in the community. Um, it was a, a very outstanding uh, event. And then I attended the uh, Brawley Chamber meeting, and of course all the talk is about the chamber, uh, I'm sorry, about the, uh, all the cattle call activities that are ongoing that started already. Um, I attended the League of Cities dinner along with most of you, and I've attended a few of the cattle call activities already uh, with the chili cook-off and the mixer last night, and met with um, Mr. Marty Coyne. I had an opportunity to meet with him, and he provided me with a good report a detailed report of his potential investment in the city of Brawley. And then I also met with another community member and addressed some concerns, uh, just various miscellaneous concerns that they had. That's mm -hmm. my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Couchman? Yes. Um, I attended the Elks Rib Cook-Off and also the Brawley Friends of the Library book sale. Very successful in both areas, I think. It was a great, some great events. Uh, the Chili Cook-Off, the chamber mixer at Chabela's. I don't sure did I report on PMHD Gala? Did uh, does that before? That's after our last meeting, right? Is that for our last meeting? So yeah. PMHD PMHD Gala and the Boys and Girls Club combo auction. I think they were all they were all. And I was in attendance at both of those. And then um, a Western music concert at the Master Chorale at the museum at the Pioneers Museum. Um, the very very nice event out there. I attended that. I did a 4-H presentation on the history of the American flag uh, for local 4-H civics. They're discussing civics, and they wanted that history, and so I provided them with that. Um, Green Bay football game. I went to the Green Bay football game in downtown L.A., and if you think we have a homeless problem, they have a much larger one, and I guarantee you that. You wouldn't like it up there very much, and it was at the Coliseum, and you have to travel through pretty much a downtown area of L.A., and it, it was pretty bad. And then uh, I attended the swearing-in of the reserve officer here today, um, and that was a great event, too. Thank you, Chief. Um, and um, that was it. That's it for my report. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Morton? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief. Um, as everyone mentioned, Chamber Mixer. Um, California League of Cities was uh, the last of a two-year um, service uh, as our division president, so I stepped down, so I appreciate it. Um, that opportunity over the past couple of years, and I uh, did also attend the PMH uh, gala. And um, unfortunately, um, although I enjoyed it, it was a close game. I attended the Bell game, didn't turn out the way we wanted. Sorry, Marty. I don't know if there's anyone, or maybe he's more imperial. I, I, I don't know, but you know, just uh, just look around. Already canvassed the room: who's south, who's north. But uh, um, didn't turn out the way we wanted. But again, all great events. Look forward to the rest of the week. Um, and that's all I have to report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I did attend a fire station presentation by Senator uh, Ben Wesso in El Centro, and he recognized some of our Brawley firefighters, uh, to include our chief here. And so um, it was just an honor to be there and, and experience that with them and represent the city of Brawley, along with uh, Council Member Hamby, who was there as well. So, And um, also uh, attended the San Diego State University President's Reception. Uh, we have a new president uh, for San Diego uh, State University. Um, and she was able to come down here and be introduced to the locals here in, in Imperial County, and I thought that was very important. Um, we don't get that opportunity often, so I thought that was uh, very significant, and it looks like there may be some greater opportunities in Imperial County. So um, that's, that's great news. Also attended uh, some of the same events that you all have. Um, let's make it a safe week, a fun week, and I do just want to take the time to invite you all again um, to my grand opening uh, on Friday, and if you can make it, I'd love to have you as my guest. And uh, that's at 5.30. It's uh, uh, along with the Chamber of Commerce, and it's uh, essentially a pre-parade party. So it's going to be a grand opening, and uh, it's been about 100 days of work, and um, I'm proud of it. In fact, I had a guest there today, uh, Council Member Couchman, came by, and appreciate you coming by there. But um, hope to see you there. So thank you. We'll move on to uh, City Manager's report. All right, nothing further at the t moment. City Attorney? I got a, a question from the police department yesterday about how to how they should enforce the peddler's ordinance. So I started looking into that, and it looks like the ordinance needs to be amended to, to remove some conditions that are probably unconstitutional. So that will be coming to you shortly, hmm. and then the police will be able to do what they need to do. 
Very well, thank you. City Clerk? Nothing to report. Nothing to report. Okay. So we're going to go back on the agenda, and that's 4E discussion staff direction regarding um, the 2018-2019 budget. So it will be presented by our city manager. You know what? We're going to take a two-minute break. We'll take a two-minute break, and then we'll, we'll get cranking. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. So it's a discussion and staff direction regarding uh, the fiscal year 2018-2019 budget. I first want to begin by thanking Council for their patience through numerous staff transitions. Uh, our various departments and including finance, both our finance director and our assistant finance director have been working hard to make up for some lost time. Um, typically, we're at this stage in spring and uh, well in advance of the July 1 start date of a fiscal year. So um, with that, I'm hoping today we can get further down the road with the intention of adopting a budget before the end of this month. And so today's goals are really about course setting. Uh, I've had the opportunity, finance and I have both uh, met with every department uh, to address division needs. And there are two areas that at this stage it would be very important for staff uh, to get direction on how to address some of the specific needs and conditions facing the general fund and the maintenance fund. Our hope is to get that feedback uh, necessary for final budget preparation by staff. And you'll see in, in some of the later content, uh, we may be ready at the end of this meeting to have a final budget uh, on our regularly scheduled uh, city council meeting date or uh, staff remain open to arranging another time for an in-between, something midpoint between now and then to, to get further feedback from council as to uh, the direction that we're headed. So just uh, thought I'd take a moment to emphasize that, you know, the standard for fiscal oversight is to try to have balanced budgets and that those budgets uh, separate the operational uh, budget from the capital budget. And our goal is always to see a balance between operational revenues and expenditures. This has been no easy feat in the city because so many um, – of our, our challenges are really about getting those resources to stretch as far as they possibly can to deliver the highest level of service possible to our community members. And uh, our service level expectations, while you know, we often uh, have room for improvement, uh, we're, we're working hard to do more with less year after year. Uh, so you know, what, what the task is at hand in this budget is for me to have content ready for you that is balanced, that does not uh, present an operational deficit. Uh, the last several years, we have um, identified pathways to bridging the gap, to patching the difference, to making uh, a run at it one more year to see if we could continue to deliver that same level of service or better with those fewer resources. And I, I think as we look at the fiscal year that we've already begun, uh, that will uh, be a very, very vexing challenge for the city in 1819. Um, do want to take a, a moment to note that there are a variety of funds that are part of the budget process, well over a dozen. Uh, the general fund is that which has the greatest flexibility. Uh, other funds throughout the city have specific purposes, some far more restrictive than others. Uh, and so we've done uh, the best we can to turn over all the rocks and figure out how can we match city needs with uh, restricted purposes. So what I'd like to do is just visit history a little bit uh, and talk about some of what we did last fiscal year. And not because looking back uh, is as important as looking forward, but what looking back helps us understand is how we have the options that are before us today. 
Um, we were very hopeful last year that uh, we would have a chance to see some degree of revenue recovery, um, and we're optimistic in those projections. Um, we also forecast that we would have a uh, decreasing general fund reserve. And last year, the council acted deliberately, uh, as it can and as it legitimately can, to provide one year's relief of the 15% set aside and uh, proceeded with a budget that maintained a reserve of uh, approximately 12%. So one of the great advantages in the year we just completed, June 30, 2018, is that while our, our revenue projections were optimistic, the programmed activities uh, were actually not completed in whole. And the reason that presents a timing advantage is because if those overly optimistic revenues, uh, revenue projections didn't meet target and we completed every project we, we named in the budget, we'd be uh, in a far worse position. Uh, at this time of year. So there were some timing advantages last year that were uh, advantageous to us. So what were some of those strategies that we employed? Uh, we, we froze our fire station number two staffing plan for the second consecutive year. Uh, we de delayed transitioning full-time temp positions that are extremely important to the city. Uh, we delayed their transition to permanent slots because we were anticipating that there may be some future additional financial challenges. And so graffiti abatement and senior center uh, staffing, both are still temporary positions, and they were so this last fiscal year. Uh, we, we worked with our existing personnel in, uh, inside of the police department to uh, assign uh, interim duties and worked within that structure uh, to give some mobility to folks within the organization, but not backfill a vacant position that was uh, due to the retirement of Chief Crankshaw. Uh, last year, we also issued debt um, and moved forward with pension obligation bonds. That allowed us to realize a savings of approximately 190000 to the, the general fund itself. Um, that savings uh, was in excess of 190000 when you look across all of the funds, but for the general fund, it represented a patch of 190000 uh, And we were also able to comb through our special funds and identify eligible activities that uh, uh, permitted us to use those funds uh, just shy of $256,000. Uh, following the retirement of Pat Dorsey, we had a Parks and Rec Director vacancy we chose not to fill it. Instead, we uh, worked with our library director to accept interim um, duties, and uh, we also transitioned temporarily a lead leadman into a coordinator role so that uh, we could beef up the responsibilities within the department itself and share oversight among two, apart two departments with one director. Uh, we reduced our sworn personnel by one full-time employee, and this was a result of the DOJ grant expiring for the school resource officer. Um, so this year we have uh, one fewer FTE, and we have actually built into the 1819 budget total reimbursement from Brawley Union High School to retain that SRO. Uh, we had an unfortunate reduction in force. Um, these are always difficult decisions for the city. And we eliminated an assistant library director. So, so now in the library uh, department or cost center, we just have the director uh, and very limited uh, permanent staff. The remainders are part-timers and temporaries. Um, we made additional line item adjustments of just shy of 146000 And uh, at the time the budget was adopted, we anticipated using just shy of 420000 25,000 in that, that ballpark to uh, accomplish bridging the gap between expenditures and revenues and making our, our second to last payment to the regional board for 133,000. So uh, with that, um, we have uh, first as we set up the budget to move forward for the, for the general fund, we try to work on reliable budget projections, uh, revenue projections for various line items that feed the general fund. And what you see uh, in this slide is the last three years of actual figures. 
and uh, the budget figures that were utilized for 1819. These budget figures were developed both with HDL, which is our sales tax consultant, as well as the County of Imperial's assessor's office that works with us to address property tax uh, projections. And you can see modest growth from year to year uh, when you look at the bottom line as opposed to the individual lines. And some of those variations either Rosa or I can speak to, um, there are sometimes one-time true-ups that occur in a given year um, or unusual circumstances in a year that show a difference from one year to the next. It's not always a perfect trajectory of growth. Question. Yes. On sales and use tax, mm -hmm. in fiscal year 15, 16, 1,800,000 approximately, and then we go to actual 16, 17, 1,186,000. Thousand one hundred seventy-one. Then we go to actual seventeen, eighteen, two million two hundred eighty-one thousand sixty-eight, and we're projecting for budget eighteen, nineteen, two million one hundred eighty thousand. Mm -hmm. So we're project, projecting a hundred thousand dollar drop in our sales Correct. and use tax revenue. Why is that? I could have Rosa up if she might join me. Um, one of the areas that we spoke through in preparing this particular line item across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, there have been sales tax splits that are different from one year to the next. One of them had to do with solar, uh, solar related activities and uh, the good years that we sometimes experience, all of our local jurisdictions experienced, and then when that went dormant, the decrease in some of those values okay. as well. exactly the uh, discrepancy between one fiscal year to the next. It was activity that was part of the county pool with the city as part of, and then once that one-time activity from geothermal died down, that was no longer a sustainable source. Okay. Okay. Isn't there, an, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is Go there ahead. an expectation for geothermal activity to grow in the north end? Are we factoring that in or not? I think that at this time there's no number to really put a measure or a it's metric to it, so that that's that's a difficult one. I think there will be some geothermal. There'll be some geothermal activity. I think there's going to be some solar activity. But the question is, is what year does that fall in? Right. And how does that how and does when? that occur? Yeah. And when? Th there are some projects. The there are some projects on the level. on the drawing board right now. But I doubt that they will benefit the 1819 year. They might benefit the 1920 year. I, I think you're going to see some development in that area. I, you don't anticipate that. Some of the new businesses coming in will generate additional sales tax revenue for us, or do you anticipate that it will remain pretty much flat? So uh, four times a year, HDL comes in to meet in depth with our finance department. At that time, uh, Rosa talks through the activities that are known to be occurring and trends that they see uh, going on statewide and in our region. <coughs> so there is uh, an intentional effort to track okay. what is coming in the door. Um, and what might be expected in the future. If any of you are ever interested in joining us, they are actually confidential because they're board of uh, uh, equalization, equalization yeah. content that is yeah. confidential, but you're certainly welcome to ever be, if you're ever available for those, we'd be happy to have you join. Would, and, you know, considering that we have the travel center that's just outside of, uh, well, it's in city limits, but outside of town, I should say, mm -hmm. um, is there any consideration with that going in? Because that's obviously a sales tax generator. Right. They're aware of the activities. That are and they, they still considered that? Okay. They I guess we'll have to compare actuals and, and, yes. and yeah, yeah, let's, let's hopefully there's a wider. For a surprise, a nice yeah. surprise. Under, under. The latest trend is uh, a growth in sales tax revenue generated by gasoline sales within the city. However, there's a decrease in sales of equipment hmm. within the city. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I had a question, question on in regards to the utility users tax. On that particular one also shows a decrease. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. So uh, when you look at 16, 17 compared to 17, 18, so let's talk through that first. You're going to see uh, when the full budget comes to you, we had some interesting uh, trends that we observed in our utility uh, arena. Because this is uh, one of the largest increases in the water rates that occurred in our four-year authorized Prop 218 process, you see a bump uh, in, in the 
the fiscal year represented. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we are probably going to go uh, uh, not see as much growth in the future because our last uh, adjustment, once it's in place until the council or the city considers another Prop 218 process, uh, will be just continuous based on uh, our existing customer base. Mm -hmm. We also are anticipating, and uh, I guess it'll it'll get sorted out after a 12-month cycle, that once One World Beef uh, diverts a portion of their sewer to the land application process, the sewer charges are going to decrease as well as the utility, utility. users. And I'm sure there's a decline in other utilities that are being used by individuals, so that's, you know, telephone. Mm -hmm. Landlines, um, right. cable, cable. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you. And I think, and then on the um, the big ticket items that were mentioned, I know our number one, it seems to be consistent revenue generator is um, fuel sales. And um, obviously, there's been, um, there, there's maybe some implications with SB1 there. I don't know. Again, a little you know, more conservative consumption, those kinds of things. But um, also kind of what happens, I, I think, on more of the national level, um, tax breaks and whatnot for the big ticket purchases and all that. So there's always those kinds of influences. Um, but we do have auto sales here that, you know, over the past couple of years that we didn't have before. So that's kind of come back to the city. So I think all the right things are there. It's a matter of, you know, really the overall economy, too. But uh, nonetheless, we have shown, like you said, modest growth, unfortunately, as we're going to look further. You know, it's really those expenditures to match that. So. So this slide uh, aims to capture where we were per our audited financials that came to the council recently. Our reserve balance uh, was just uh, above 1.7 million. We are in the process of closing out uh, fiscal year 17-18. The, the values that are represented as revenues and expenditures are those which are booked to date. And so uh, when we close the year, uh, barring any adjustments that may have fallen through the cracks prior to the audit being completed, we expect that that uh, patch actually constituted 523000 And that includes the regional board payment mm -hmm. uh, as well as the 492 I, I believe that was the figure. Let me just double check uh, 392, 724 for uh, the general fund reserve usage. And so uh, when we uh, look to the close of 2018 and the beginning of July 1, we have estimated that our on hand unassigned balance is 1.2 million. Okay. 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 So, um, I'm going to go through a series of slides. My hope, um, as I explained a little earlier, was to talk about two funds. I won't uh, go into any detail on the other funds because we worked through both the project lists, uh, the input received by council at prior workshops, and we'll be ready to package those other funds uh, for your consideration in the very near, near future. But the, the two funds that we'll be focusing on for today are the general fund and the maintenance fund. So um, as, as noted earlier, um, we have had an opportunity to, to both uh, have our initial sit-downs with every department, uh, go back to the workshop format, receive that input, do some additional uh, legwork, meet again uh, with, count, with uh, staff to review bare bones requests. Now bare bones are what are the real true cost of doing business, not the would be really, really nice to have not the, um, we would really like to move in this direction. Um, it is what line items need to be in order to end in the black. So in places where there were, for instance, um, underrepresented, um, uh, let's say, fuel costs or underrepresented uh, electricity uh, uh, line items, those were adjusted to reflect actuals. Uh, there were also a, num a very limited number of cases where um, optional expenditures were included, and I'm going to talk through what some of those were. But what I do want to begin with is explaining what isn't in the budget. We have no new permanent positions in the budget, the only, with one exception. 
which was the hire of a police chief, and that occurred from the last fiscal year to the present. And so we're very pleased to have, continue to have our own city police department, uh, but the police chief addition was, a, was part of a transition that occurred with the fiscal year that began July 1. Um, included in the proposed budget uh, projections are no code enforcement officer, no parks and rec director, no social media coordinator, no firefighter for the fire station two staffing plan, no, no assistant library director backfill, and no city funded school resource officer. Um, last year we began a transition. One of them I would call permanent and the other, I guess we'll see. Um, but for now, uh, we'll continue in its current configuration. We combined planning and community development services and uh, we have one director over two of those departments, or prior departments, which is Gordon Gaist, and we transitioned um, an existing building inspector into an interim building official. Uh, Parks and Recreation, as previously noted, uh, Director Pat Dorsey retired. We did not backfill. Uh, Marjo Mello is serving as uh, the interim director of both of those departments. In the current budget before you, uh, in the worksheets that were provided today, um, we do have the use of special law enforcement funds to uh, address a couple of, of needs in that department. Um, those would primarily be described as supporting IVECA related activities in Pearl Valley Emergency Communications Authority. As you may recall, we had uh, upgrades to the regional communication system backbone. It ties us up for 10 years of payments. Uh, the first two years, the IVECA fund balance addressed those payments in full, and now they're phasing in for the remaining, remaining eight years of payments, portions for each member agency. So we are applying the use of special funds in order to accomplish that. Um, we are also proposing, and you will see um, in the final budget presented to you, um, a vehicle replacement. We are facing, or, excuse me, a vehicle uh, acquisition. Um, special law enforcement funds cannot be used to supplant. They can only be used uh, to augment. And so we'll be providing you with a little bit more detail on that. And we also have a need to uh, upgrade our console for the dispatch center. The council uh, took action with reference to some of the physical configuration of that space at a recent meeting. Uh, but this is because the console has to be upgraded to communicate with the, R the new RCS backbone, it is a significant expense that is in the realm of, it's shy of a half a million dollars. We have a strategy that we hope to employ that includes um, using special law enforcement funds in order to pay for a portion of it and then to finance the remainder because the, that console is going to service the city and our contracted agencies uh, that receive dispatch services for a number of years. Um, this is uh, kind of our general uh, bare bones approach to uh, our line items and um, I'm certainly uh, happy to answer any additional questions that you may have on that as, as we move along in the presentation. So what I'm, I'm hoping for today is to get uh, council's uh, <coughs> feedback on service level changes. Um, in in uh, the every week <coughs> opportunity that I have with each of you to receive feedback, I, you know, I think this is probably one of the most difficult topics to navigate because our resources aren't growing. They've been shrinking over the last several years, yet the service level um, expectations continue to rise. And that 24-hour cycle um, continues to create demands on the system for immediate feedback and immediate response for city services. And, and when, I, um, when I make reference to that, I don't mean so much the public safety uh, response to 911 calls. I mean uh, the, the kind of classification of urgent, emerging, and uh, need to get in the queue so it can get completed in a normal work order system. Uh, because we've gone through so many changes in re recent years, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. When I first got here in 2011, one of the strategies that we regularly employed was universal application of a targeted reduction. I would say to everybody, you must present me with a 15% reduction strategy and a 10% reduction strategy. And that worked for a couple of years because there, there were, really were areas where there was cushion and fudge that could be leaned. 
But now so many of our non-essential uh, cost centers have uh, lost that extra, extra room. So th it, we try to use that budget adjustment process as a method for saying, okay, we are happy to, to address the new needs, but we, we can't do it within the existing uh, authorized budget. It's something that's going to require additional resources. So we have a, a number of departments that are skeletal. Um, I, I know each of you are familiar with them. Uh, there were a lot more people in this building uh, a number of years ago. There uh, were more police officers. Uh, the only department that had an opportunity for growth uh, in recent years was the, the fire department because of the opening of Station 2. And really, any, any other staff augmentations that occurred were uh, implemented as temporary positions because there was a desire to have the higher service level, but not necessarily, we weren't in a position to create permanent positions uh, that we could commit to for the long term. Uh, one of the other areas that, that we're hoping for direction on is um, the notion of cost recovery. And I know this isn't the most popular concept because um, I don't think any of us wish to offer services at the city level that are out of the reach of our residents. So, you know, the culture of Brawley is to do everything possible to make uh, our services immediately available to everybody across the board um, and our facilities exist to be used, not to be locked up for somebody's reservation and payment. Uh, but because there's such little cost recovery, we find that in the non-essential areas that are not public safety, uh, that we have this kind of erosion of the revenues that are occurring and the costs continue to rise. Mm -hmm. So with that, we don't kind of have any form of an offset. And um, one of the areas that I, you know, urge the council maybe to consider from a policy point of view, maybe there's a method from a policy point of view to approach cost recovery. It's not, uh, I'm not advocating for 100%, but maybe it's 10% of actual cost. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's 20%. But in, in most of our areas of business, they're nowhere near what it actually costs to operate a facility. And um, we, we definitely have, as departments, uh, a, a more detail to share with you in that area that are examples. Uh, one simple one is if uh, we're staffing this building today and a user wishes to come in and use the council chambers, there's no charge because we're already here and the goal is to have the space used. But there's, there, there are no fees attached to a use. So it, it um, has been a great way to deliver services, but I'm not sure for the long haul that it's the best way to ensure that we can maintain uh, the facilities to an acceptable standard. Uh, we can get out of the mode of deferred maintenance, which is everywhere. We see, de just as, as council sees it and community sees it, our staff see deferred maintenance every, and we're trying to stretch those dollars, spend them three times um, so that we can, we can uh, have as much of an, an impact as possible. Um, I do not foresee that the, the city will adhere to the general fund reserve policy um, this budget cycle. I think we're pretty far from getting there. Um, again, that's a 15% set aside of operational expenditures for the general fund. Um, and based on what we kind of see on the horizon, um, that is going to be a very, very uh, uh, major challenge for us in this and, next fiscal year. And just a question, that 15% set aside is figured into this budget and is indicated in, in indicative of the gap or not? No, it, it is not. not. Okay. It is not. So we're clear on that. Yes. And yeah. you're not talking about a reduction from like we did, I, I think a year ago, from 15 to 13 or whatever you're talking about, just to all out maybe a... Well, um, you'll have 1.2 to work with, but yeah. we do have some items of responsibility that we anticipate we'll be facing. But we have the 1.2 million to work with mm -hmm. at this That's point with yeah. this budget. We have 1.2 million in reserve, not uh, plus a million dollar gap. Okay. If that helps to, so the difference right now between operational revenues and expenditures including things like our final payment that we made July 1st to right. the regional board, right. it gets us to just shy of a million dollars okay. of a gap. So the goal for today's discussion is to figure out how can we close it or what is your appetite for closing it. If I look at areas, and I'll, I'll define a few areas that I would like to further review right. and see if we can accomplish that million right. dollar divide, we right. can close it. Right. Uh, I, I am not anticipating at the end of 
2019 that we're going to have a 15% set aside unless you're willing to do something no, much more not. dramatic than okay. close a million unless dollar we gap. Close, unless we close something, we're not going to have that much of a, of a reserve. We may have a reserve. It just depends upon how much, how, what level of that reserve that we're comfortable with at this point in time as a mm -hmm. council. You know, is it 1.2 million? Is it 1.5 million? Is it 500,000? Is it right. half a million? What are we, what are we comfortable mm -hmm. with? And okay. I think that's really what it boils down to. Okay. So what we have in the next few uh, slides are kind of testing the waters for is this something you'd ever consider? If, if the answer is no, we'd love to scratch it off so we don't need to further study it. But if the answer is yes, um, I will be working very closely with finance and the departments to, to hone in on the exact number of savings associated. So in parks and recreation, there are quite a few temporary positions that have been put in place and are a part of our normal operations. What I would like to be clear on is that the trade-off is significant changes in level of service. So for parks and recreation, our temps include the admin secretary who uh, assists with staffing that office with two bodies um, every day at the Lions Center. We have two full-time temporary maintenance workers that are assigned to our, uh, do things like mow uh, and support special events, etc. cetera. Uh, and then we have our senior center coordinator. We did a reduction in force right. a number of years ago to eliminate the permanent position. Right. We brought it back in a temporary format. Right. Um, if, in, and I will ask that, that Parks and Rec be available for further questions. But in this area, what, what would be the translation of a, lev a level of service change will be grass that's mowed less frequently, less maintenance overall, uh, less availability of staff to pick up the phone when a call, maybe we can return calls, but not be a live person every single time. And if the council's wish is to keep the senior center open, we would be looking at ways to utilize the, the existing permanent staff that is currently uh, at the Lions Center, which that would uh, drop down to one office person, our recreation coordinator, and have her operate out of the senior center. But that means all the normal activities that occur out of the Lions Center would then be, uh, would be translated to foot traffic at the senior center so that the senior center could stay open for its normal hours of op operation. And when summer day camp is going on and open gym and all of those activities, uh, our, our rec coordinator would not be on premises with those activities because she'd be supporting the senior center's open hours. Um, okay. In fire, uh, we have a, a different I situation. I need a little bit more okay. information on that. When I'm looking at something like that, I kind of need to, I think ultimately, just for direction of the staff, okay. I think I need to know more the amount for each of those positions and what we anticipate saving if we didn't fund, what we anticipate saving if we funded at a lower level, or what we anticipate a part-time individual and those kind of things. I've got to make that kind of evaluation when I get I'm into that kind of depth. I don't think it's necessary right now, right. but I think that's something for direction to you is I need to know if I'm going to eliminate one of your maintenance workers, how much is that really going right. to save me in the overall scheme of things? And how much does that, that evaluation do? Do I have to mm -hmm. pay any overtime to other people? Do I mm -hmm. have to, you know, all of those are little factors that right. I have to kind of know in order to make an educated uh, decision on some of this stuff. So rule of thumb for all of these positions, they're all paid the exact same thing, which is $11 and some change per hour. Okay. Because they're full-time tents, they are Affordable Care Act. Uh, they invoke the Affordable Care Act, so right. they they uh, have the medical benefit component. So, so they get a medical benefit component that adds to our cost. Correct. Mm -hmm. But it but it's something that we're required Correct. by federal law to do. So we don't have a whole lot of choice. Right. So Unless you reduce Unless the hours. Unless we reduce the hours. Unless we reduce the hours. And if you're using the same people, you can't just back them out to avoid health insurance. I, ha I, I understand that. Yeah. Right. Okay. But that that gives uh, me a better idea. I got it. I've got to be able to see a figure, and I've got to be able to start reducing down and say, okay, this is what I want to do, right. or this decision, I'm going to keep this person, but I may have to do something with this position. Well, that's I don't want to say person, but positions. Right. That, that's, that's what really she's asking, really is what direction are we providing? Yeah. So and I think I need additional that way, information. That way she can 
provide that information. So uh, one thing that I think is like an important takeaway, if, if I can emphasize anything else, that the goal wouldn't be to provide the same level of service that we do today with the remaining permanent staff. It requires a fundamental shift yeah, in the shift. level of service right. we provide. Right, understood. So um, this kind of way of trying to patch the senior center is because, you know, it's clear the, the city has a desire to have an age-restricted facility. That's why it's there, and that's why it's been open for as many hours a week per year as it right. is. This might be some way to bridge it, but, of course, it creates other issues with reference to oversight at the Lion Center facility, which is really a hub for so much more activity. Right. If everything was together over there, that's one issue, mm -hmm. but it's not together, right. and so that poses some right. other problems. And I'm sorry, Marcia, did you want to add anything? approximately $24,000 a year. Um, I can also say that uh, when thinking about this, one of the things is to look at a level of service. We have a contract with the um, Catholic Charities to have that f their side of the facility open from 9 to 1 daily. If there was no senior center or a person there, um, one of the regular parks workers could open it up for 9 a.m. and go back and secure the building again at 1 o'clock. Uh, we would have no staff on site, which normally, even if somebody rents the Lions Center for a birthday party, we not only open and close, but we have somebody available, but we wouldn't have somebody available for that. If the office, like she mentioned, if the offices were moved from the Lions Center to the Senior Center, um, it would create a different set of, like she mentioned, service issues in that you've got everybody coming in to sign up for all the leagues that we still can offer, depending on what your position is on doing programming kinds of things. And I know that sometimes there's lines out the door kind of a thing just to, just to sign up the kids. Um, again, the issue with phones and even people who showed up would have a longer wait because there's only one person who can handle what they do. And to be perfectly honest, offering a specific thing to seniors may or may not work if that person is tied up with the amount of, of right. clerical and operational work that that person still does. So, so there's, there's trade-offs both ways. Right. Whatever your decision is, there is a way that we will still offer services. They'll just be looking at the contracts that we have, um, what we can do with who we have left, and those kinds of things. Same things with the park maintenance workers. If we do not have two temp people, that means that lawns will not be mowed as often as they are. Um, and the real intense landscaping that we do for Little League and other organizations that we work with for when they have a um, multi-area event, so we make sure everything is absolutely tailored and gorgeous and manicured, um, probably wouldn't happen because there just wouldn't be the, the time to do that. We have four parks maintenance people and a lead person. And again, um, if it's decided not to have the other two, actually it's two and a half part-timers, um, there would be differences in that. The half a part-timer right now currently works mostly on the pool. Um, and because we only have one person on the pool, which is Fanny, Who's, who is a lead person also. Um, weekends, those kinds of things may be looked at totally differently. So there's those, kind, those kinds of things to look at. And then I want to throw out another one that nobody likes, and that is if the pool is only open from April or May through October and it's closed the rest of the year, that is you do have a significant people saving and actually chemicals and a few other things that, that could be saved but you also would not be serving the high school or the, um, the local league that we have. So there's lots of trade-offs back and forth. I'm happy to go into more detail, which takes time, um, but this is just off the top of my head kind of considerations to look at. We can always do what we need to do. We've done that at the library for many times. Marjo, does the 24000 a year include the medical? Yes. No, that's no, it does not. It does, no, it does not. An additional for some of Okay, thank you. Okay. Just for, to make sure that I understand who's working right at the Lions Center, what do you have right now? What staffing level do you have right now? There are three people who work within the office traditionally. We have Miguel Perez, who is the parks coordinator. 
but he's in and out all day. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have um, Linda Self, who is the recreation coordinator, and she's in and out all day. And then we have Rachel Cepeda, who is our administrative assistant, who pretty much is there all day, but still makes runs to City Hall and other things. But we always make sure there's at least one person available. And she's the temp. And she's, a, she's uh, the admin secretary. She's the admin secretary, and, and she is temp. She's oh, yes, a temp. she's okay. a temp. All right. So in the office, sitting in the office. It's Rachel. It's Rachel. Rachel and Linda. Linda so right, but Linda's out some of the time. Right. Yeah, she's moving in and around out. to the right. different areas. Okay. Gotcha. Sounds to me like you already have pretty much skeleton crew. I mean, that's my own opinion. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> and this is what makes the choices so difficult. It's it is. Exactly. Okay. And that's just Parks and Rec. Wait till we cut it Okay. Anymore. So oh, I think yes. maybe the, <laughs> the good rule of thumb. Uh, when you look at, uh, and I'll, I'll make sure I note every person who's paid that that $11 and some change, they're going to transition to $12 an hour with mm -hmm. the change with the beginning yes. of the year. Yes. Um, but in general, for those who have been with us for a period of time, they've already gone through the look-back period for the Affordable Care Act, and the additional 10000 gets attached. Right. I didn't want to bog us down on this, okay. but, but I do think we need additional information in order to make certain decisions. Okay. So, um, Actually, it is super helpful for all except for the dispatcher, that topic of how much does it cost. Because every single one of these positions, minus the dispatcher, is paid an identical rate of pay. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So um, I'll move next to the fire department. Our reserve firefighters are the, the patch that we used when we opened two mm -hmm. fire stations. We could not... Um, financially managed to create the permanent staffing to support it. So we have full-time temps that staff those shifts that we refer to as reserve firefighters. And if council had an appetite for um, eliminating all temp positions first with the intent of closing the gap, living in our means, and accepting uh, the level of service changes, uh, then we would move forward with a recommendation to eliminate the reserve firefighters position. And with that, I would like the chief to come forward. Chief Peraza has worked with me to better understand and appreciate what impact this would have on our operations. We would still have two fire stations, but one of those stations would have a different uh, schedule for hours of operation. Can I, just to confirm the number on the... Um a staff worksheet, it shows eight um, reserves. Is that correct? Eight? Is that the correct total? For on, a, on a daily basis? I'm just going by the, the yeah, staff sheet. Have, uh, I don't have that personnel one. sheet. Shirley? Chief, we currently, we talked about this. It's six reserve uh, firefighters right now that's covering shifts. Six? Okay. Yeah, six. Okay, because this All shows eight. All different. Those it, are the ones that are it, it's, act, it's actually five that I have. Okay. Yeah, but just get the, well, that's right. You would have had the six months. Yeah, right. yeah, that's correct. So if um, we did eliminate the reserves, um, station two would have to go into what we call a brownout or a complete blackout, which means the station would be shut down on certain days or be completely shut down. The one thing that station does, two does is we have our county contract. So we respond to our county calls out of Station 2. Mm -hmm. We also have our ladder truck that's housed there. And um, we also respond our mutual aid out of Station 2. So those are the three main aspects we'd be losing. Everything would be shifted back over to Station 1. Can you expound on mutual aids? What do you mean by so that? So mutual aid is if we had a fire in El Centro or even our wildland fires, that station is responsible for responding to those calls. So those are the ones that we basically loan to other areas? Yeah, but we, we still get compensated when we, we move out of the burst. county. Within the county, it's just a mutual aid agreement. Yeah. Okay. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can you explain what a brownout brown would look like from a scheduling point of view? So scheduling point, we'd lose those five positions. So over at Station 1 on a daily basis, instead of uh, us having seven firefighters a day, we would go down to five, which would be very difficult to run. Okay. And, and Chief, as a reminder, what um, 
Is there like an average daily on the medical <coughs> calls? Because obviously we've discussed this in the past, so yeah. kind of explain how. So busy right now we're running four, four or three people on medical aids. We uh, reduced it down to two. For instance, yesterday we had a call and we had a multiple of eight people on scene, including Gold Cross, and everybody had their hands moving. So um, services would be dropped. Before Station Two was open, <coughs> how, how many personnel did you have? Uh, at station one? Four. On each shift. On each shift. Yeah. And it's two. It's how two many? shifts two now. Two shifts. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, if we were to if we were to either brown out or black out station two, how many would you have in station one at that point? Five. So we would we go would back we essentially lose like almost two or three people a day. And and go back to basically service levels of before station two. Yeah, so. That's correct. Okay. Chief also just so um give also just to kind of <coughs> remind the public a little bit of how fire service works. You um your personnel are working um I, I know they're called different things, Kelly schedule, modified Kelly, but they're working twenty four hour shifts, correct? They're, currently, they're working at 4896. Okay. So, um, if we did uh, lose those positions, we'd also increase our overtime. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody called in sick or took vacation, mm -hmm. we would not be able to backfill. So, we could actually we probably drop down to four or three people a day. So, there's that risk as well? Yeah, yeah I think the significance there is um, even <coughs> between police and fire, they're really vastly different as far as the scheduling model. Mm -hmm. Um, in rest periods, et cetera. Right. Um, obviously, the um, service being provided, the tempo <coughs> might be a little bit different, too, on a given day. So I think that's it's kind of important for yeah. council to understand. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Chief here? Let's move on. Okay. Um, on to PD. We have two existing temp positions there. One is our uh, very skilled graffiti abatement worker. And um, what is currently a vacancy at uh, PD, which is our part-time dispatcher, we're in the rare position of actually having filled our permanent slots, which is fantastic for the dis in the dispatch world uh, because we, uh, when we don't have every permanent position filled, we really incur a lot of overtime. Um, the part-time dispatcher is the backfill when there are vacations, sickness, et cetera, of the regularly scheduled individuals. So those two... Uh, are the only uh, uh, temporary employees with one caveat. The janitor that is a part-time janitor at the admin office also does uh, a number of hours weekly at the PD. So uh, both graffiti abatement and janitor are making the same, they are compensated at an identical rate of pay as the reserve firefighters, uh, admin secretary, maintenance workers, and senior center coordinator. Um, on dispatcher, because uh, we were really very challenged to backfill that <laughs> option before, we were unable to ever attract anybody to the dispatching part-time temp position at a, a minimum wage. So uh, the, uh, the approach to dispatch has been to offer the rate of pay that's step one of the range mm -hmm. for the normal uh, permanent position. Okay, so that is the topic of temp positions um, and, and trying to kind of manage the, the question of what service level changes are tolerable. Not, not easy subject matter to be sure and uh, I thank you for uh, being open to hearing the explanations for what, what would result if those changes were implemented. Can I ask one quick sure. question? It, do you have an idea of where the tipping point is with things like dispatch, fire, PD, if you eliminate uh, someone who is either part-time or, or full-time, um, where overtime kicks in for other uh, employees that that goes above and beyond what that part-time worker was making, do you do you know where the tipping point is on in these different departments? Um, I don't think I have a, a perfect model yeah. to provide. Yeah. Um, in it, it's so the it PD universe, it kind of yeah. grow. It's yeah. a different topic because of them being a 24-hour operation. Mm -hmm. Unless unless you're changing the level of service, 
you're trying to backfill. You're always in a catch-up game mm -hmm. because you're always trying to backfill for the vacancies you have to hit your targets for the staffing level, and it's, it's a vicious and continuous cycle. While there's vacancies occurring, uh, the people who are on staff are being asked to work more and more hours. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it, I can't recall a time. Let me think. Maybe in the last seven years there was one time every single position was filled at one time. For two days. Wow. And, uh, Chief, if you have any further information you'd like to share on the top, I'd be happy to yeah, catch you tonight. Mayor and City Council, Robert Sawyer, Police Chief. So as it regards, in regards to the, the dispatch positions, we currently run two dispatchers per shift, 12-hour shifts, seven days a week. Um, prior to having all the dispatch positions filled, we operated with one part-time dispatcher and a couple of agencies. Uh, what that results in is a reduction of dispatchers in the com uh, communication center at any, any given time. Uh, we had several periods where we'd have four to five hours a day with one dispatcher per shift and several days a month where we had one da uh, dispatcher per 12-hour shift. Um, as you can imagine, the phones do not stop ringing, the radios do not stop going off. We have police response, we have fire response, not only for the city of Raleigh, but for our contract cities as well. Um, so it's almost unmanageable with one person in dispatch. Um, currently, even as we stand here today and, and we're fully um, staffed in terms of full-time employees, uh, that's two dispatchers per shift, and that includes our dispatch supervisor working a full shift versus just overseeing supervisory duties. Um, she actually has to sit in front of the communication console, answer phones, and, and dispatch uh, emergency service personnel as well. So any reduction in staffing is going to, um, in, in turn, alleviate some of the, the the individuals in front of the consoles to answer the 911 lines, to answer the business lines, and to uh, dispatch emergency services. Um, in the past, what we've done for uh, short periods of time for breaks, we've had a, a officer stand in for dispatch, but it's a very unique skill set, mm -hmm. and it requires a lot of patience that um, I, I think we have some of the best officers in the nation, certainly in the Valley, um, <laughs> but it's it's a completely different skill set, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm married to a dispatcher. I have been for a number of years, and um, I can tell you I've done everything I can to learn some of their skills, and um, it, it's a difficult job. So any reduction to permanent uh, staffing in the dispatch center is going to have a direct impact on the safety and well-being of not only the citizens but the officers and firefighters in the field as well. Uh, the part-time dispatch position, our hopes with that is we have one candidate um, that's in the background process right now. If that person was successful, um, and we're at one from three, um, so if this person were to be successful, that would uh, allow us to maintain the levels of two dispatchers per shift, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, during times of vacation or sickness or, or anything like that. Um, so as you can imagine, at any given time, we have 10 to 20 percent of our workforce out for a number of different reasons, um, approved leaves and so forth. Uh, without that part-time position, we would uh, be reducing some of our hours, and, and there would be periods of times throughout the day where we had one dispatcher per shift. Hopefully that answers some of your questions. Chief, if you don't mind while you're there, if I could just um, maybe shed just a, just a tinge of light on what Councilmember um, Hamby brought up about the overtime management. And this is for all our departments, of course, but I think in particular in, in years you're able to, because you're so data-driven anyways as far as uh, peak hours, peak times, peak you know calls, all that. Um, you, do you have a pretty good um, idea, at least, um, with our department? I know, you know, relatively new, you know, tracking and watching what's going on with the department, how we're managing things like overtime, and um, how that is managed and mitigated, and sure. and maybe give us a sense of what. So currently, that with break the, even, the tipping point, as you mentioned, might be. Yes. So the current staffing levels, as I mentioned, without the part-time position being filled. We backfill the, the employees that are on vacation or on leave, um, any of the approved leaves or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, in order to keep staffing at, at the two dispatchers because that is a crucial number to us. Uh, most communication uh, centers are our size but prefer to have three dispatchers per shift or maybe a swing shift, a third person covering during the peak hours. Um, usually any, anywhere between, uh, and it varies days, you know, day to day, but usually anywhere between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. We do have an afternoon rush, we have a morning rush um, of calls, and then you have kind of lulls throughout the day, depending on the days of the week. Monday usually being a higher call volume day because uh, people are returning back to business and, and business owners uh, returning to work and, and noticing whatever uh, may have occurred over the weekends. Um, so hopefully that answers some of your questions. Yeah. What we've done in the past here 
is we'd have a gap within two, to, uh, two hours before the shift, two hours after the shift, and we would fill that with the part-time position in the interim to be able to cover the, the peak times of, of the day or night. Um, certainly we can get by a little bit easier between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, with one dispatcher per, uh, per shift. However, all it takes is that one major event, whether mm -hmm. it be one mutual aid fire uh, call or you know, a structure fire within the city, um, any major uh, law enforcement activity. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is we not only dispatch for Brawley Fire, Brawley Police Department, mm -hmm. our contract cities, but we have um, mutual aid agreements with other agencies, uh, such as the Necrotic ta uh, Task Force, Bureau Valley Border Enforcement Security uh, Task Force, and some other agencies that come into our city that will utilize our resources and our airtime to provide them services um, and, and benefit them throughout their time here in Brawley as well. Chief, Chief, with respect to the some of the agreements that we do have with other agencies, um, is there is it stipulated that we would have uh, X number of dispatchers, or is it just uh, that we're providing the service? So in our in our memorandum of, of, of understanding with the Narcotics Task Force, for example, we have an agreement that the, they will be allowed to use our radio uh, and our dispatch services one in our city, uh, and that would extend to our contract cities as well. But we do not have a staffing profile okay. within the MOU that requires us to be at a minimum staffing level. No. Understood. Any further questions? Thank, Thank you, you, Chief. So um, this wraps up the topic of temp positions. And um, uh, there are a number of areas that we are describing as possibilities for bridging that difference between revenues and expenditures that, that might be up for further dialogue. And is there any other ideas for places that council would like to see consideration? Um, uh, we're open to hearing um, those ideas. So the second area um, that is proposed as a possibility is suspending non-essential city contributions. This would be anything that isn't a JPA uh, obligation. The city is member to a number of joint power authority agreements. Examples of that would be the foreign trade zone, Imperial Valley Emergency Communications Authority. These are our contractual obligations that we have as a member agency. Uh, but there are also other entities that are voluntary contributions. Uh, some of them um, are a critical resource for us uh, and are important partnerships. Uh, but examples uh, are things like SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments. That's our federal metropolitan planning organization. We could opt out of a contribution for a year. What is, excuse me, to interrupt. But I guess what that is, is part of the question. I what don't is have dollar our dollar around? amounts. It's, it's we to less than $2,000. Yeah, we're not talking about We dollars. have the uh, League of Cities, also a, a important resource, but a voluntary yeah. contribution. We have the Film Commission. Mm -hmm. We have okay. two pending requests that are actually uh, significant from uh, the Chamber of Commerce to provide 45% of the TOT. Remember that request for this current fiscal year that we have not formally answered. And we also uh, have a request from the Small Business Development Corporation. Uh, we have an IVEDC contribution. We have actually already made our chamber contribution for the year. Um, and I would need to cross-check the timing of invoices relative to all these other entities. But this is uh, a possibility that I want to make sure the council is aware of and within our control to opt out. And we do a lot of sponsorships, other things that we do on an, on an irregular basis, just mm -hmm. as they're requested through us. I don't know how much money that saved us, and I would have right. to really take a look at what we spent last year and what we would anticipate spending this year in order to get a clear picture of what we would Right. Consider. The sponsorships we can pull, but in general, the line item that that gets pulled from is Perfect. in the City Council Cost Center, and I believe the number is 3,000. That's what I remember off the top of my head. So mm -hmm. it might uh, seem that there are multiple requests that come forward, but it, it all well, is, it, it amount, ends yeah. up being a wash in right. uh, your travel, training, right. and event right. sponsorship. It's coming from I've individual uh, yeah. budgets. I've right. got that. Uh, okay. It's still okay. money, but it's right. money. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with the bottom bullet first because it's easier. <laughs> and then I'm going to ask uh, staff to be available for questions in the upper area. So the first one is maybe thinking differently about special event support. This isn't a new idea. This year we've been trying to do a better job as staff to capture the true costs that are being incurred. Uh, 
as I dig further and further on this topic, it's, it's an interesting concept in that when public works perform, no matter what, we're charging ourselves for the work. We're incurring overtime and equipment rates that we charge to our own internal cost uh, center. But the other thing that's curious about it is if public works performs this work, they bill it to the street fund. So it's using funds that would otherwise be used for maintenance activities. It's an mm -hmm. interesting trade-off. Mm -hmm. so it's not huge sums of money, generally speaking, but it definitely is in the thousands. And mm -hmm. my guess is if we took, took care to capture for a full year what we do, it's probably a six-figure sum in total. Yeah. Because oh, there's yeah. still funds being, you know, it still costs that. money to do the work. Right. right. But, but I, I guess when you talk about eliminate, we might significantly reduce some of those. But I think when you talk about eliminate, do we not do the work that we need to do for cattle call? Do we we do, do cost recovery oriented activities. Right. But, whatever but that, that percentage gonna, is. Is that going to fly or does that eliminate certain, certain functions that the city does for the benefit of the public or for the benefit of the city? Yeah. Does that eliminate that? I think that's mm -hmm. what we have to weigh in terms of deciding you know, what, what are we going to do? There may be some cost recovery that we can do. And I think we've been reluctant to do that with nonprofits, as, as you know. Uh, we're, a little more, we're a little more in tune with doing that with for-profit entities. Uh, but I think that that's something we've got to talk about. Do we have a fee? Do we have, and do we enforce that fee? And do we want to continue that? I mean, how much money does that bring us in? And then how much does the overall scheme of things look at your, your right. um, I think in general, I can only think of one occasion in seven years that we had a private company ask for a road closure, maybe twice, and it was the same entity, Inferno. And the reason it was accommodated was because it was to support downtown, positive downtown activity. Right. So it was a very conscious yeah. Um, yeah. effort. All the others have been via a church or nonprofit organization. Yeah. Right. And uh, honestly, uh, it's a great feat that we have accomplished insurance coverage for right. all those all parties all that create that. risk. I think that's step one. Step two is how can we get some form of cost yeah. sharing so that everybody isn't knocking yeah. at our door, hey, yeah. why can't you do a, a road closure? And, and that, I think, is very important. I know we've talked about it. You know, nonprofit doesn't mean for loss, you know, and so it doesn't mean that they're not making any money. So it just means that they're just not taxed in the same manner that a for-profit business is, right? Making money. Right, and so that's one thing I think we do need to consider. I know there are significant costs in road closures and other things that we do and provide. Um, so I know we've discussed it in, in, uh, as council, and I, I, I certainly think that that's one of the things that we need to look at closely, along with the other things that you've described, um, just to make sure that we're, at the very least, um, covering some of the expense in going forward. And may not, obviously, we may not recover all of the cost. However, um, it won't uh, hurt us. It's certainly going to help and augment, you know, and, and reduce the cost that, you know, is coming towards the city. So, uh, you know, if we look, treat or ordinance, existing ordinance as the city's kind of history book, our ordinances say honor cattle call, cattle call festivities. That has had a significance to the city in a different way than any yeah, other yeah, activity yeah. that has ever come right. forward. So uh, that carve out has been something that's very deliberate. Um, but the everything else is maybe it what to be, consider. It used to be we only did right. a lot of street closures for cattle call. Mm -hmm. Now we do street closures for You're almost around. everything. And I'm at, I'm at a level now where I want to reconsider some of that and what we do. Because okay. I don't think it's always necessary to close a street. I think it mm -hmm. may be neat for safety purposes and it, may be, and it may be good for some other reasons. But I think we, we're closing way too many streets too, too often. And I think that's a problem for us. And our cost recovery is well, so I'd like to what's non well, well, I think when, when <laughs> yeah. people recognize that they can come to the council and ask for it to be done and we're going to say yes if it's a nonprofit or whatever, I mean, that that's just also um, increasing the number of requests, yes. you know, so. Uh, I, Creating an appetite for sure. the waiver. It doesn't mean we raise a lot of more revenue, though, mm -hmm. because right. pretty soon if you charge, then people aren't going to come you and have you close the street. So you don't raise the revenue, but you don't lose the revenue. Yeah, you don't lose it either. So, so, so there is some it's cost a washer, recovery. Yeah. There's Certainly. no overtime for staff. Right. In fact, it expenses. still would make sense in that, in that case, because if we're not recovering the full cost, um, it, we're numbers. essentially still subsidizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're not, you know, at that point. So, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So with that, I'm going to go to the first bullet in, on the slide, which is this topic of cost recovery. Included in this area are all kinds of topics that the council has considered in the past. And there have been varying levels of enthusiasm for consideration. There have been direction provided. Let's study it further and bring it back. So I thought it would be helpful to kind of do a catch-all 
Um, maybe there's one or two that might be new subject matters, but um, if I may, I'm going to look to our chief, uh, our fire chief, to first talk through the, the item of fire. This is emergency medical services. Council last considered this subject matter as a lead up to the utility user tax uh, topic, and at that time, council said, let's make sure we get the utility user tax addressed, uh, and if it cannot happen, we have absolutely no choice but to look at charging. We are uh, a rare exception to the rule yeah. that we provide the these sure. services sure. at no cost. And um, the reason the topic came forward from fire in past years has been um, sometimes we experience uh, at the service level uh, frequent callers that uh, they might be more aged members of our community have health issues and loneliness issues, and we become their go-to 911 call for EMS uh, service. Okay. So um, th that That's was like the way that we originally That's came right. to talk about this. Maybe we need to do something. Maybe it's a movement in that direction. Again, not 100% cost recovery, but something that is an offset, and we begin to kind of create an edge uh, on, on the costs that we're incurring and, and smoothing those edges so that they're uh, less for us to absorb. So okay. with that, if you could recap the number of calls sure. and your average cost yeah. again. So on our yearly basis, we're running about 2,500 calls and probably about 90% of those calls are EMS calls. So when you talk about cost recovery, you want to look at the whole pie. Do you want to do EMS and fire or do you just want to do EMS? Do you want to charge for just your, your supplies used or do you want to charge for the <coughs> personnel, the time, the apparatus? I mean, there's a big gamut that you really have to take a look at, and it all depends on exactly how you want to do your cost recovery. Um, a basic medical call, you, you use oxygen mask, uh, blood sugar check, uh, blood pressure check. You may start an IV. And with <coughs> the number of calls of EMS last year, um, I think we came up with a, a number of about $56,000, and that's just basic supplies. Mm -hmm. That's the medications that are used mm -hmm. or anything like that. So you could look at, you know, just your cost recovery for your supplies used or go bigger on that. Is there, is there um, a standard that's used um, across the country <coughs> or, or across the, the state? For you example, know, like if, uh, if it was just basic um, supplies that are used, is there like a dollar amount that's well, used? The, yeah, there's a dollar amount, and that's the number I came up with, is, and that's the vendor that we use. It, the, the number uh, on the supplies just varies just a little bit. But um, keep in mind that we are the only city here in the county that does not do any kind of cost recovery for fire and EMS yeah, besides the start. city of Westmoreland. Um, but you, like I said, you can break it down just in, in, in the supplies <coughs> you use or you know, go, go through the big picture of the, the personnel, the time, sure. and so on and so forth. Like but there could be a standard a standard fee um, for a particular service that's being offered, right? I mean, that, that could be it. Where it's taken into account the personnel, it's taken into account um, the services uh, that are, or excuse me, the, the, the products that are being used. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So. I, I stand corrected. I'm sorry. It was 3343 per call. Oh, yeah, 3343 per call uh, in 2017, 56,831. So that, the, the, that's just the, the uh, supplies. supplies that you're using. Basic supplies. Uh -huh, basic yeah. supplies. That's not taking into account the, 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 you know, the, the, personnel, the personnel that apparatus. are going out there yeah, and everything yeah, else, right, correct. and the apparatus costs and everything that's else. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you, and then you could take even into the picture the... Uh, estimate the amount of fuel you yeah, use yeah, yeah, and yeah. so on and so forth. So, so it, that could easily be five, six hundred dollars just to arrive there and take care of a person right, or whatever it is. Right. Yeah, and there was a company that we kind of uh, ventured I remember out with, that, yeah. and they they do have a a so-called number like a formula, uh, yeah, yeah a formula that yeah. you could work with, and yeah. they can actually tweak it to to your desire. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to share that in in. Um, the last uh, conference that we attended, um, just as a matter of information, because I was already thinking of cost recovery, I did talk to several of the cities, and like you said, I think 100% of the ones that I talked to do cost recovery for those type of calls. That's true. So I think it's something that we really need to pursue. Um, I know that the c local cities, like the city of El Centro does also, mm -hmm. so maybe we don't have to reinvent something, maybe we could just use something that 
the city of El Centro or some of the San Diego area cities use, like some of the smaller cities, like Santee, I know, has a cost recovery also. Sure. Yep. Do we know what El Centro's is, their cost recovery? No, I think the last time I really kind of looked into it, it was probably in the, in the amount of 200 to $300 for a, a basic medical aid. The only other question that I have is, does insurance, does somebody's insurance pay for some of that at times, and then sometimes it doesn't, right? So you've got yeah. people that are insured that, that we could recover that cost fairly easily, maybe from, and then there'll be other people that we can't recover it fairly easy, easily from. And so I think we need to be careful about that, but I also think that we need to recover where we can recover, because I think it's important that we at least start the process. It doesn't have to be a large amount to begin with, but I think we do need to start. Now, if insurance is paying for that, or if something somebody is paying for that, you know, the client has some type of insurance or medical covers it or whatever. I think we should we should look into that also. Yeah. You'll know, see yeah, see how see what we're going to recover, what we're not going to recover, because there'll be some people that we won't be able to recover that cost from, even though we're billing them. We still won't ever. We may never receive. No, you, you are correct that you, you're not going to get 100 percent cost recovery no. off, off right. something right like that. Now getting, getting now yeah. Getting yeah. Yeah. Right now we're, so we're getting I, zero. Right now we're getting zero. I think but in some do, ways we're we're penalizing ourselves. But, you, but the most companies that you work with. And I, you know, I, I would recommend it going through a company rather than putting the full burden back on finance and go chase down. Yes, right. Yes, I agree. But you do go after they get their fee the and they yeah. first. There's a service fee. Yeah. yeah. There's a service fee. Yeah. Okay. And I imagine to some extent collection if they're right. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. And they work with the insurance companies yep. where they can. Yes, sir. And insurance always fights to to lower mm -hmm. the the amount that they're going to pay out anyway. But mm -hmm. with a company like that, they're they're doing all the legwork. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Chief, I know you can see him. <laughs> we, we brought this up each time you brought up the topic, and then um, I think you were going to go on about the potential of getting um, potential cost recovery from the responding equipment um, apparatus personnel. If we went that to that length or that far, um, I brought up before, and again, I'm not clear 100%. This would be more your your uh, swim lane here, but um, there are some matching funds that could come with that as well, correct, from the Fed level? From what I understand, yes. Yeah, that you're yeah. not eligible for if you do not have a, a, a fee schedule. So yeah. by just virtue of having a fee schedule, it, it, I, I believe it might make us uh, or put us in a category that's eligible for some matching. I don't know whether it's state, you know, the Medi-Cal fund or, you know, or, or federal Medicaid. Um, you're you're um, correct on states. that, but I, yeah, I don't have any kind of dollar figure yeah. in my I've, head. I've heard that. that in previous workshops around other yeah. larger city um, fire departments. Um, okay, so having said that, what do we, just for information, what do we need to do to implement that? Is that by way of ordinance, or is that just something that we do departmentally, um, Bill, if we went toward a fee schedule? I'd have to look what we did in Calipatria, but I think we just passed a resolution. A resolution, okay. yeah. <coughs> because we already have the cost. It's not like we don't have that right. cost. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's not a problem. It's mm -hmm. a cost recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Then what happens Definitely. is the, the department gets a contract with somebody and comes to the council for a refund. In yeah. Calipatria, we did it several years back. It was it was seamless. Yeah. And they, the chief hall up there just he gets what he can get, and he doesn't. It doesn't beat dead horses. Yeah. Yeah. Calipatria is a lot poorer than Bravo. Right, right. And you consider that it's not going to be 100% cost recovery. But if it were, <laughs> I mean, even even with simple just mathematics, let's say it was, yeah, let's say you're, you're yeah, you you probably have another three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars that you would collect, you know, depending on the dollar amount that was, was collected. So, you know, that it, it's significant. And you also have to, uh, to keep in mind our call volume is going up every single year. Yeah. And so the amount I'm put I'm spending in medical supplies is increasing it's every increasing, single year. Yeah. And then also, and, and my recommendation would be to, to chase it all, EMS and fire. Yeah. And then yeah. fire, you, you know, it's the same thing. You go after insurance I companies and you, and, you, and you have them go to Because that's very significant, right? I mean, that's, that, yeah, yeah that's, that's extremely yeah. significant. And, and Chief, I think the public would be more palatable if we knew, if we could substantiate that there's some additional assistance that kicks in for having that fee schedule and charging. So, I mean, it, it, it's, 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 again, getting those dollars that we're not eligible for right now. That's correct. Yeah. Those dollars are, are for what, though, for, for new so equipment? For the response, if you charge and you're not getting full, you're not whole on your cost recovery, mm -hmm. there's matching funds okay. Uh, okay. that I've heard in the past. Again, I'm, I'm assuming that still exists, and I'm assuming that's why a lot of the um, larger metropolitan departments went to this. It's big dollars. Mm -hmm. I, you um, know, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I, you I, know, j just a general statement, though, not just with fire, but every service that we provide here in the city of Rolling. I think, you know, for decades, many years, uh, people have expected 
um, a level of service without having to pay for it. And I mean, I understand that that's what people desire. I would, you know, I desire the same thing too. And we've done the job in trying to maintain the level of service with everything, you know, without having to, to go to the public. But at this point too, I mean, we have to make sure that we're protecting the agency, that we're making sure that we are um, not subsidizing um, costs, you know, whether that's road closure or even uh, responding to a 911 call. I think we really need to very closely look at how we are um, trying to recover cost, you know, because it's public money, you know, that we have to account for. And really, we're using the public's money anytime we're responding to a 911 call, anytime that we're closing a road. All of those things are, uh, pu you know, those are public funds. So. I, d I can tell the council when Cal Patriot started recovering on fire, there was not one bit of backlash. Yeah. Hmm. Not, not one person came in and complained. I was kind of specific to that incident yeah. with that one person. And usually if insurance covers it, then they're not going to say too much. Right. And, but and like I say, they don't, they don't go medical. chasing people that don't have the money to pay. Right. Same thing with medical, same thing. I think, yeah, council, member, percentage. council Member Hemi, you had a comment? I was just going to ask. You said you, you've you've uh, discussed this in the past but never moved forward with it. Was there, was there a reason that you can recall that this no, was never? No, I think just the desire within the city. Um, you know, the, there are a number of groups, whether they're uh, people who use our parks department um, or, you know, anything. There just hasn't been a desire to recover um, the true expense, mm -hmm. you know. But at this point, you know, considering how our finances have turned over the past many years, uh, we need to really consider um, how we operate within the city. I think it's just critical that we all look at those things. Um, and, uh, you know, we do subsidize many organizations. We subsidize many uh, user groups, you know, to our parks. And, you know, not to say that we're going to recover 100% of expense. I know we're not. We're still a public agency, and we are expected to provide some level of service um, um, to the public. That's just part of, you know, living within the city and paying taxes. But, um, when it goes beyond, and I would think uh, closing a road is going beyond what should be expected, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, even providing um, service like a 911 service, you know, if somebody ends up at the hospital, if I, go, if I walk into the hospital, I'm going to be charged regardless, right? I mean, so I don't think there's, there should be any expectation that things are free, so. And, and if I can add, I think it's important to understand also we had Measure W coming up. We knew we had a sunsetting utility user tax. Um, and, and I think we've got to be kind of cautious here as well. Um, we're not going to recover. I, I think there's some big impact, lower effort things we can do in this greater discussion we're having on the budget. I think we've got to, um, I, I think as our city manager said, take the policy approach here, a reasonable approach. It's not going to be a 100% you know, cost recovery, but we need to kind of shift our paradigm as a city. But having said that, this isn't going to be the solution to what sure. we're you know, obviously looking at. Um, so we need to make some other decisions, I think. So I just think with that, we can get the details on this, but not to get too caught up in the weeds saving maybe what might be a total of you know, $10,000. I'm not talking about the um, cost recovery on fire, but I'm just talking about if we get into each and every little contribution. I think we just approach this as, as mentioned, policy-wise, overarching. We need to change how we're doing business. Yeah, I um, think I think that's reasonable. That's yeah, but uh, meanwhile, I think there's some bigger decisions we're going to make that obviously have much more impact to this budget than 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 this discussion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, but as far as this one, this particular one on fire on EMS, I I think that we need to probably uh, move on that one as soon as possible. Yeah. I, I think for all items, we probably well, yeah, need but to I, I, because you know, yeah. only because we have we have discussed this one and. It's, it's one of those things that we were talking about, the possibility of having to close the fire station. I mean, this could really have an impact on, sure. on Public supporting safety. the yeah. personnel. So I think it's one of those things that maybe we need to give direction to staff as, uh, as soon as possible to move on. I, I think that that's one thing that we're going to consider here, but okay. we're, I think we need to get through the presentation to see okay. where yeah. we end up deciding. I'd, I'd be more than happy under the, the direction of the city manager to bring back some numbers to you. Thank you. Is there any other comments from council? Mm -hmm. no? Thank you for the information. Yeah, you're right. I yeah. mean, I, it, it, yeah. it's a lot more of the same as far as uh, animal control, um, the alarm permits, fake alarm calls, and, uh -huh. and I, I think. 
from what I'm hearing from council and from my, my own perspective as well, I, we, we need to see how this is impacting us. I know that, for example, the credit card finance charges, um, we, we, because we introduced it a few years back, mm -hmm. several thousand dollars a year that we're paying, um, you know, again, going back to cost recovering, seeing how this is, uh, you know, uh, costing the city. I, I think we just need to look at the, the, the final figures and, and consider okay. all of these items. Um, um, there's one, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, there's one that um, we've discussed before, and I don't see it specifically listed, but I have talked to uh, Rosanna about it um, actually today in regards to getting our partners that use the pool to possibly help out with the expenses. And I know that she, I don't know if you want to, you sent a letter to the to yeah, the uh, High School Superintendent regarding that? Yes, um, we have not renewed any of our uh, agreements with Brawley Elementary School District, Brawley Union High School, or IBDA, uh, Imperial Valley uh, Desert Aquatics. Um, each of these organizations contributes um, an amount based on uh, going from zero to an, starting with a yeah. fee. Yeah. And so that fee hasn't been changed since those MOUs were established a few years ago. Um, we haven't renewed for a number of reasons. Number one, the we didn't have a budget adopted. I wasn't sure what direction it was going to go, so I wanted to be sure that the users were put on notice that this could be changing. Um, uh, one of them has indicated we understand the cost of doing business has increased, but there it, there is no offer to, to pay more voluntarily. So I don't think the voluntary route is going to change the contribution, and because right now the, the pool is cold, mm -hmm. so cold. The, use, the use has diminished. Oh, yeah. um, IBDA has temporarily relocated um, Brawley Union High School. I'm not aware that they they're are actually using. utilizing. They're not using. They're not using. They're not using. Okay. Uh, can, so. I, can I comment, on, and thank you. The only thing I'm going to say, and it should be included in everything we're looking at. I mean, not just the pool, obviously. All, we're, we're talking about everything. But I do want to make a comment. That's one of the users that's actually already paying something. Yes. So, I mean, we yes. kind of keep yeah. picking on them, yeah. but, but uh, this paying. is the one group that's actually paying something. Yeah. You know, we're talking about several organizations that paid zero for use of, 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 of city um, um, resources and, and facilities. So I think if we approach this, as, as mentioned, high-level policy, we shift across the board. And it may be a modest, sh modest shift in, in the beginning. And the other thing I was going to say, for using IBDA as an example, the swim team. So you're going to go from 500 bucks to what, 600, 700, 800? I mean, whatever the amount, it's not – it's still not near the cost to operate and have a pool facility such as we have. It's kind of you need users to have the facility chicken and the egg, right? But I just, I just want to caution as this keeps coming up, this is the one group that's actually paying something yes, right now are. under an MOU. So, um, and the alternative, the thing that's so hard about a pool yeah, is that, that it's pay nothing. Um, the thing that's difficult about a pool is that there's still water in it all year round, whether or not there are users. That's right. <laughs> so right. the difficulty. Uh, the there's a maintenance right. issue. Right. And yeah. um, one thing that's really interesting when we take a snapshot yeah. of, uh, let's say, the 16 17 fiscal year versus 17 18 that we just finished, because we're uh, really confronting some capital needs at the pool, which mm -hmm. were anticipated. None of these are yeah. real. Terrible surprises, uh, you know, plastering is the next 100-pound gorilla yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing that daily rate for the cost of operations minus personnel. It's going from something like 270 to almost 500. Mm -hmm. yeah. a, a, as cost. is our staff costs and all yes. these variables that we're talking yes. about. So that's the only thing I wanted yeah. to say. We kind of were honed in on one narrow, you know, use yeah, and one facility. Just use caution. I think we approach this whole thing citywide. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I think that's, that's there. important, but we, it, there has to be a shift in our way of thinking. It has, yeah. to, it has to occur. I mean, that's without question it has to occur. I know we've been reluctant, um, but it has to occur. I don't think we're necessarily living – beyond our means. I just think that we're subsidizing so many things over the, uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, the course of time. If you can maybe look back in the past five years, we've probably subsidized things to the tune of multiple millions of dollars, right? And so that whether those are responses to 911, whether that's um, user fees that were never collected, yeah. whether that's, you know, processing fees for credit cards, whatever it is, when you collect all of those dollar figures, that, mm -hmm. that probably amounts to very, very significant okay. number. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're, we're taking from our reserve account every year 
um, to try to, to, to fill a gap. And quite honestly, if we just have this shift in, in our way of thinking and how we collect and charge for things, mm -hmm. yeah. I think there could be much less of a gap or we, we can be in a position to where we're still offering the level of service that's being requested from the public and we're not necessarily having to jump into our, our um, reserve account. So. so the culture of the agency, just as an observation, has been use. The yeah. goal isn't to be a vacant building or a vacant park that nobody's using. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've maybe sometimes shortchanged um, the maintenance needs that it takes to, ma to have them available for use. and year-round and mm -hmm. as much as, as they are enjoyed. And so the flip side is that uh, it, then we receive a response from the community that we're not doing enough right. to Understood. address yep. maintenance it, it, needs. Or, or, right. or, you know, I think, too, you know, a lot of sort of things that have happened in a very traditional manner, whether that's requesting at the last minute, um, you know, Santa be dropped off by a fire truck or whatever, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like those sorts of things that have occurred for decades. Um, when the community was smaller or costs were much lower, mm -hmm. you know, the, the modern day, I mean, things are very expensive, whether, and we've even had injuries when that's occurred, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an added expense to the city. Mm -hmm. So all of those things need to be considered. And, um, you know, unfortunately, nothing is free. Mm -hmm. So we just have to make sure that uh, we're addressing these things carefully. And, you know, I'm not about, you know, trying to collect every single dollar from every person. However, um, we're not collecting anything from many. So we need to really kind of shift our thinking and, and make sure that we're protecting the agency and making sure that we're providing service for everybody. You know, so. When we have the numbers presented for your consideration, I think you're going to see that on things like, let's, let's use EMS as an example, something uh, as low as a $40 charge, or let's say 50 mm -hmm to something that we could justify but is $500. Right. Obviously, you're, I, I, I don't see the city going to the $500 level mm -hmm. <laughs> this fiscal year. But <laughs> I, I do see that a gesture in the but right direction. But why wouldn't direction. we, though? I mean, but why wouldn't we? That's my point. It's like 100% cost recovery is a lot to... Okay, but yeah. maybe it's not. It's never going to be 100% cost right. recovery because let's say mm -hmm. we are billing insurance and we're collecting you know, a fraction of that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then there's going to be, but why not consider what it's truly costing us? We we'll, have we'll to show you sure the gamut, but uh, um, my point is only just as when we talk about the pool or any of yeah. these other topics, it's somewhere in the middle. It's probably mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle. It's not sure. the lowest and it's not the highest. It's what is your policy as a council for right. what you aim to see as recovery? I, I think that's important, but I think also what I've seen over the course of my time on council is that councils do this. Everybody's reluctant to to approach the public and say, "Well, let's ease into this." It's always easing into it, and what's happening over the course of time is that we're subsidizing and subsidizing and subsidizing and subsidizing, and you get to the point where we're at today. And so now we're having to really look back and say, "Hey, you know, now's the time to change." Well, you know, whether we should have changed before or now, we really do need to consider. You know, certain things like 911 calls, like other, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's a street closure, because that's multiple thousands of dollars, and we're not charging anything. You know, and like I said, whether it's a nonprofit or a for profit or whatever it is, um, you know, we're not preventing anybody from having an event. We're just mm -hmm. saying, hey, if you're going to have that and you're going to request it from us, and uh, meaning the public, you know, remember this is the public's money, right. then there needs to be some offset of cost. So I'm just saying we need to shift our way of thinking to help um, our situation. And, and I do agree with the sum, the sum offset of cost, <coughs> and I do agree that we should be getting certain costs. I do, though, think from the other side that the public looks at this as they pay their taxes. They expect a certain level of service from the city by regards to those taxes. But I think when we do special things or when we do things that cost us above and beyond what we may be getting in, in revenue, then I think that's when we have to look at this. I do not expect us to get to 100% cost recovery because 100% cost recovery doesn't consider the taxpayer's dollar that they pay into the system. So I think we got to look at partial recovery, and we have to do that immediately, I think. And then we have to look at how do we handle these things. Special events, special road closures, 
that means that the public is paying for that through their tax dollars. Maybe the agency that wants that needs to pay a portion of that or, or, or some of that in order to offset that cost to the public. And I agree with George on that. I think on some things like fire and police and everything, people kind of pay their taxes. They expect a certain level of service from that. If there's something special that we do or there's some cost recovery that we need to do, I think they expect to pay that. But they don't want to pay full cost for whatever service that they're getting because they feel they're already paying a portion. Well, I think, you know, w with respect to taxes and, and expectation, I think, you know, the expectation is that the fire department's available, right? Right, it's right. Available. absolutely. The staffing levels are available. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and so, but if you're, you're dialing 911 for a medical call, there's, you know, just like anything, there's going to be expense in that. I think Correct. that's an understandable expense that people will have, you know, and so, um, so, you know, it's just those things I think we need to shift our way of thinking because, uh, uh, you know, not everything that, that uh, the city provides is free. You know, no. uh, you know it's, it's not everything's not. paid for with uh, somebody's tax dollars. It's just there's a variety of items that go into funding a city. But um, we do need to shift our way of thinking and making sure that we're collecting um, in areas where we haven't. And I think there's so many areas where we have I think a lot of these areas fit within that. This yeah, I think up. so, too. So I think our, our direction maybe, or, or maybe our direction as council, or at least my direction to you is, is to look at these costs and what we're going to be charging for people. Okay. Or what it's costing. Or what it's costing yeah. us so that we have an idea of what we want to put in place, right? Okay. I think so. Um, do you want to talk to the lighting one? And, and if you wouldn't mind, if I could yeah. have you forward I mean, just for one second, the tournament. Is is, is council, are you, is everyone comfortable with that? Is that something that is of interest to everybody here on council? I'm definitely right. in, interested. Like I said, I even did my own kind of personal survey of calling around the cities and found out that basically we're the only yeah. city that I knew yeah. of that was not in, in, involved in the um, EMS uh, right. uh, recovery. And as you know, I've brought up about the Parks and Rec, specifically about the pool, and we've discussed the road closure thing, and I think we definitely need to look at some cost reimbursement for that if we're going to do it. If people, if nonprofits want the roads closed, then we say this is how much it's going to cost you. And then if they don't, then that's fine too. Yeah. Okay. So, no, Norma, to be clear, I just because yes. this is open session, so let's talk about it here. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have cost recovery. All I'm mentioning, there is cost recovery in place with the pool. That's all I'm saying. So whether yeah, it's enough or not, that. I think that's what we're trying to determine with all of these. So just let's let's make sure we're conveying that. that there is some cost recovery. It's never going to be enough, but uh, that's all I'm throwing out. Is yeah. There is cost recovery. At least in that, in with that one scenario, that, yeah, there, there is scenario. some cost recovery. Exactly. And maybe if we had that much so cost recovery in every yeah. scenario, we'd be better off. Okay. I think right. Marjo has had provided us with a, a detail on that as yeah. far as how much we I've recovery. seen it. No, Mar it, there is. There's so detail on it. <laughs> is there anything else that, that lighting, you'd like to add there, before couple, we move on? There's a couple things. Okay. One, one is um, the direction you're going with road closures. I started with Parks and Rec in February. As of the end of October, I was involved with nine road closures. Okay. And what, if we had charged fully for them, it would have equaled the $12,000 we needed for chemicals for the splash pad only. Okay. So you're right. This, this is what we're looking at. As to things like um, other various fees we're looking at for lighting, our budget is last year was $40,000. And the actual costs ended up um, being a little over 58000 So what I want to reiterate is, is we're not looking at 100% cost recovery, but we do need to look at what it costs for the difference. The gap, the the gap, gap recovery. The gap recovery. The gap recovery. And what we'd also hope by doing, working with a gap recovery is also, at times, people book a field for practice, and then they cancel it, and they don't let us know. So there are lights on with nobody there, and it still costs us. So there's a lot of small details that go along with some of the recovery that we're, we're looking at with lighting. Um, as for tournaments, we have not been charging um, for, for anything other than, well, let me back step a little bit. Um, the policy that you currently have does not charge children or any youth programs at all for any lighting, for Understood. tournaments, for any of those Understood. things. Yeah. Okay, only adults. So if we're going to do this, it needs a little bit, the policy needs to change to be universal. Okay. Okay. And, and I think that's where we're at, Marjorie. Okay. Sorry to cut you off, but yeah. I just no, want to make sure, I think we're, we're all on the same page with yep. respect to, you know, trying to recover costs. Good. So, yeah, yeah. So 
we can get your hard numbers. Thank you. That's what that'll be good. That'll be good. And Thank recommendations. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, the PD mention is does actually require a. We have an ordinance on the books that allows uh, for a certain number of calls, okay. uh, which is set at three. Three. Yeah. Um, Chief is has uh, done a review of that section and suggests that false alarm calls that we approach it in a, a different way because it does take a lot of our resources sure. that could otherwise be devoted to to other uh, sure. public safety needs. And then finance, we've already talked about the credit card processing, right. so we can okay. take another look at okay. that. Okay, we're going to try to, I know okay. we're, we're running long. Mm -hmm. um, other possibilities for <laughs> cost-saving measures. Um, as council knows, uh, the planning, when the planning department uh, merged with development services, the physical location changed to across the street uh, next to the Boys and Girls Club. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ideas that was identified among staff was the idea of having this building shut down for daily use and all of us that lo are located in this building uh, relocating to the utility billing slash finance department and saving on the expense of operational costs in this building. That would eliminate the regular janitorial needs. It would uh, reduce energy consumption. The building could be used for uh, public meetings. Yeah, I think in all practicality, though, it wouldn't, I don't think it would be okay. a good use of. I don't mind looking at the idea. I just don't think it's yeah. practical. I think it's a little extreme I, I tend to at this yeah. time. George. I think that's a little extreme. <laughs> well, that's yeah. the point of the exercise that's is to find right. out yes. if we don't want to just have it be convenient. Let's scratch that one. Okay. <laughs> and, unless, uh, and I guess what we need to look at on that and what we would want to look at on that is does it make it more amenable to the public? Does it make it more helpful for you as admin staff? Being co-located with another, with another, is is there mutual support there that might be beneficial? I think that's what we would need to know. Not so much, the, it's, it's partly the cost savings, but it's partly does that work well or does it not work well? And I think that's the bigger issue. I would be happy to have further discussions with staff, but really the intent of this option was to address uh, the reduction right. in operational expenses. Yeah. That was the end goal. Okay. 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 Um, other possibilities. Um, our employee benefits, as they're currently defined, we've got MOUs, we have contracts, uh, and we have a pool of um, unrepresented individuals. Um, our MOUs call out, uh, our MOUs and contracts call out um, specific uh, training opportunities. Let, let's say, for instance, you're a, an employee that has a certification requirement for your job description. Uh, renewal of that certification, continuing education on that uh, uh, topic or subject matter is something the city is contractually obligated and would need to bargain yes. in the MOU reno renewal right. process to change. But there are there is a pool of unrepresented employees um, that the council uh, does have the ability as the governing body to uh, direct, either authorize or eliminate um, the resources to support it. And um, so I, what I wanted to do was walk through a number of these and not take too much time. Um, I, I would like to note that travel and training has been severely cut back in um, our times of austerity. and. What is in the travel and training budget currently that isn't a contractual obligation tends to be oriented around roles that have professional development needs, that have uh, changing landscapes that require um, uh, a timeliness, a timeliness address of ongoing needs. Uh, so in general, travel and training is, uh, is nowhere near the benefit that it was five years ago. Um, when we go through the process of individual cost centers, I actually require, for those where there's optional training, a justification for what it is, and, and many departments have their numbers slashed. Um, so they're, they're very lean numbers as they are, but this is certainly an area if you're struggling with the concept of eliminating positions and other major uh, changes in the budget that I want to be sure I point out is available as an area for reduction. Okay. Um, 
would also like to talk through what our sick leave buyback is. What is what I'm is not that? sure everybody's not familiar sure. with this, and it's kind of an, a, an interesting right. feature um, with some history in our city limits. Um, I'm going to have Shirley on standby uh, to, to make sure I stay in, uh, on topic. Sure. So our sick leave accruals are established based on your number of years of service with the agency. And sick leave is a flat all the way across. I'm sorry. Okay. And after you accumulate a certain number of hours, you have the ability, if you don't use it and you meet a particular threshold, you have an ability every year, once a year, there's something called a sick leave buyback uh, program that's implemented. Okay. Now, what's interesting about it, in my opinion, is that it's not like vacation, where if you don't use your vacation, it's the employer's obligation to pay it out right. when you leave. Right. Instead, it rewards people for not using their sick leave. Right. And maybe on some level deters them from long leaves of absence if they are ill. Um, Shirley, can you walk through? I think it's more an issue. Yeah, the sick leave buyback, sick leave is not a liability to the city, but the city of Brawley has had established this policy many, many years ago. So if you bank 192 hours, uh, fire is 255 because they accrue differently, um, you can sell anything in excess once a year back to the city at your current rate of pay. Mm, it's very nice. Sick leave buyback occurs in July. So it, it does create massive amount of work for the finance department. They generate notices to the employees. And currently, um, that's pretty much, they send out a memo. This is how much sick leave you have on, you have not taken three days or more this year. You qualify. How much do you want to sell back? They run a special payroll. Once everybody comes in, runs a special payout, payroll and pays it out. How much do that usually run? How, many, how much do they usually acquire? During that time period, uh, in 1617, it was 61,000 mm dollars. -hmm. Of that 61,000, 46,461 was in the general, the general fund. fund. No, but I mean, what do they generally accumulate at the county level? When we had that program, mm -hmm. you were allowed to buy back 47. I think it was 47.9 hours at the end of a year. If if you if you had if you kept a certain balance in there. You could you could buy back half of I think what you accumulated, we which was 47.9 hours or something like that. That was the limitation. That was the maximum you could buy back. You could buy back less than that, but not any more than that There's per no year. Max. There's no max. Yes, yeah. If I just want to uh, clarify, the employees eligible for sickly buyback once a year have to have two years accrual on the books. Anything in excess of that, they're able to sell back half of what they accrue in one year. That's what the county and the policy other, was. The other so. um, qualifier is uh, they can't um, call in sick three days, like for uh, PD or fire, and for regular eight-hour employees, it's 24 hours. Okay. The other departments have 10-hour shifts, 12-hour shifts, so they can't call in sick more than three days. More than three days during that so time, they or they can't buy back. No. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty. So I think that's pretty much the same as the county policy, or close to it. I, I, th I think that was that was what it was. It gets a little complicated, and there's some things that happen there, and uh, but um, okay. Is that a negotiable thing? Or is it it's in all the MOUs. So it's it in contra employment contracts. In 1718, the cost to the general fund was 39,000, with a 53,000 total price tag. So it is in each of the MOUs, so it is a negotiable item. It is a negotiable, so we just can't say no. We have to negotiate that. For unrepresented item. employees, the city has control over uh, right. what benefits are offered. Okay. It's kind of one of those embedded, unless you came out, of, came out of the public agency world, I never knew this benefit existed. Maybe yeah, not. it's been in right. place at the county for years and years and years. It's an interesting and unique offset in that it's not a liability. So why would you pay somebody to... to I, I, I think they did it as a benefit when they did not give pay raises or something came along place. like one year and it, and it got placed in there and it just became kind of the general, the mm -hmm. norm. I think they did it for, for a long, long time. They also, for department heads, they a vacation buyback. And I could buy back vacation if I was a department head at the county. But and they we don't, don't have, we don't have that. that here. All right. Well, let, let, let's keep moving forward, right. if we could, please. That okay. way we can okay. get through the Great. presentation. I um, want to also make note that we have an option to change employee benefits as it relates to the 75-25 cost-sharing split. 
We haven't had an opportunity to study this in depth, and because so few of our whole population uh, in our employee base is actually a participant in CalPERS, the CalPERS medical program, uh, where we don't qualify as a bona fide program. So even if the city wanted to go in a direction of decreased cost sharing, let's just say for the sake of argument 50-50, it probably will be in excess of 50-50, but less than 75. We need to run all the calculations based on the universe of, uh, of, the, of the enrollees and whether or not the premiums offered, how we still fall within the affordability spectrum. So just want to make that. It's an area that we'd like to look at a little bit more. Um, but again, if the, uh, the wish of the council is to kind of turn over every rock, I think this is an important one to consider. Um, the fourth bulleted item with, is with reference to the cash in lieu of city medical benefit. Um, this is a topic of significance to the city in light of the San, city of San Gabriel, uh, Flores versus city of San Gabriel decision. Um, we think this will be a centerpiece of discussion uh, in the bargaining uh, at the bargaining table mm -hmm. next year because our ability to um, offer elevated overtime rates, we don't have the, the financial wherewithal to provide it to all of our staff. So okay. if, if we remove this, the option for personnel would be to either uh, this would be a qualifying event. They could either enroll in the CalPERS medical uh, uh, benefit that the city offers or uh, provide evidence of coverage and receive no pay, no cash in lieu of. Because as long as cash in lieu of exists, it applies to overtime rates. Right. Okay. Um, I have a question about that. So if you were to... Is that that's something you have to negotiate as well, or that's a policy change? For unrepresented employees, unrepresented. it is a benefit change that can uh, be implemented uh, if you have no MOU and no contract. If you have no MOU. What's the yeah, proportion of, of employees that have that, um, that are unrepresented? Our number unrepresented. of unrepresented employees: 46, 46 out, out of 140. 140. Okay. So 46. Yeah. So the others would have to be negotiated. Yes, and all of our MOUs are up for renewal mm -hmm. at July 1, 2019. I'd so like to see a cost factor on that, though, sure. as we talked happy about to prepare before. That. And then there's also overlap between these last two bullet points. If you eliminate the cash in lieu of mm -hmm. and you reduce the 75-25 cost sharing, I mean, that's... It would be savings in two places. Or yeah. expense reduction. And that's you will have more people than that are that are needing the 75-25 cost sharing split if you eliminate the cash in lieu of benefit. Correct. Okay. okay. This state some figures on that. Yes. Okay. okay. This is the next one not so easy to discuss, but um, it is a strategy that has been employed in prior budget years. Um, mm -hmm. We could move the direction of, uh, it, so the intent when council gets to see once a month the personnel summary, the reason that uh, regular report was created was so that council had uh, advance awareness of open positions and whether or not they wanted to pull the lever and say we're not moving forward. And it comes from maybe a little bit of the history and experience that council felt like positions, permanent positions were being added at a very rapid rate outside of the control of the governing body. Right. So the goal was to always have these stopping points and make sure that we're checking in um, and, and raising awareness about those positions. Mm -hmm. So uh, historically, instead of eliminating or laying off, or doing reductions in force or uh, taking a swipe at temp positions first, uh, the, the city has looked very seriously at vacant positions. Um, it's, it's a way to minimize the impacts on existing employees, but the downside is that it is sometimes in areas that a reduction is going to be very problematic. It's not necessarily timed or in a place that's with an area of council priority. Right, across the board hiring freezes don't always work because it may be not a position, it may be a position that you must fill or a 
or right. you really feel like you must do something. And in our experience as a city, the greatest turnover occurs in public safety. Right. So uh, without a doubt, if you're going to freeze open positions, 99% of the time, they're going to be police department, police department officer yeah, positions. Be police yeah. officer positions. So in essence, if, you, if this is the approach that is taken, we are saying as a city, this is an area that we can tolerate a change in the level of service. So I just want to be sure. And then there's an offset by overtime because you have a limit because you have limited positions. Is that not correct? If you reduce the number of officers that you have, you have a reduction in the level of service. You're not trying to backfill something that you don't have the people. But but I think that ultimately, if, if when you're doing one or two positions, maybe, but when you're doing a large number of positions, then you're going to get the overtime issue that's going to come into play because you're going to have emergencies. And there's going to be right. people that we're are going always to going about. to have emergencies. We can so count on emergencies for public safety. Yeah, that's going to always yes. happen. So, yeah. so there's, there's some give and take there, I think. And we can talk about you know producing a couple of positions, but but I don't know that that ultimately works. And uh, rule of th thumb, total cost in per officer for a Pepra employee, approximately seventy four thousand yeah. dollars. So it, it helps you see, too, if you look at police officer vacancies versus the 10, let's say the, the 24, 24 plus a 10 so for the benefits, you could get right. two of a low-wage worker, but they're in very different areas. And yes. the question is, which is more critical? Because this Correct. is the pathway that, you know, we've got to determine. Rosanna, yep. but yes. if we were to be looking at something like that as far as um, public safety, we would have to look at what services they would cease to provide. Correct. Because you can't have them providing all the services we provide now. Correct. With less police officers. So. Right. Yes. And our police chief is prepared to speak to what those items would be okay. if he had four less officers. Okay. Well, and we don't know that it would be four, but it, it could be. So currently there are four vacant officer positions. That we don't have field crew. Right, and one part-time dispatcher. I think he, he did a great job of describing what occurs with, right. with the part-time dispatcher right, did. Okay. reduction. But on the four police officers, if you wouldn't mind, Chief, just uh, briefly to describe yeah, to some of the things that are actually not being offered in other cities that we offer. Are you, do you have an appetite for it? Okay. Good afternoon again. <laughs> so currently we are sitting at um, four open or vacant positions. Um, we have ongoing recruitment efforts uh, that are occurring as frequently and as often as we can we can make them. Um, we have current plans of attending some of the police academies here in Southern California to attempt to uh, fill those positions should they remain available to us. Um, currently, what this what the four vacant positions represent for us is one in patrol, uh, one at the Drug Enforcement Administration Task Force that is not currently filled. Um, two in what we would refer to as a problem-oriented policing or a vice setting. Um, think of it as kind of a, I'll still, uh, the ex-police chief's explanation of it as kind of a brush fire team. As things pop up within the city, a uh, two-person team that would be able to respond to the immediate needs of the city on a case-by-case -case basis, whether it be narcotics-related, graffiti-related, gang-related, whatever the case may be. Um, and then the, the other position, the fourth and final position that currently is not filled is the traffic position. Um, so historically, we've had an, an officer assigned to traffic enforcement within the city of Brawley. Um, we have a brand new or very, very new Harley-Davidson motorcycle that's in storage over there that we currently do not have the bodies to be able to, to put out there for mm -hmm. traffic enforcement purposes. Right, right. Um, what the lack of traffic enforcement in the city represents to you is a reduction um, in about 1,800 tickets per year um, over the last couple of years and currently a reduction of about... Uh, well, I can tell you that in 2015, a total of 2,300 traffic citations were issued. In mid to late 2016, we lost um, the full-time traffic officer, um, and we had a reduction to 1,467 traffic citations. 2017, we had no traffic enforcement officer in a full-time position. We were down to 710 citations. And then as of this year, we have 337 citations issued. So you can see the extreme um, difference in, in traffic enforcement. And, and what does that translate into as far as, like, uh, you know, revenue? Well, so revenue, I, I don't have um, at my fingertips because there's a number of different um, sure. facets to that. It, it goes towards the percentage that we get within the county. We don't, we don't receive a large amount of revenue 
for each traffic citation issued, we receive a percentage based on the sure. violation. But what I can tell you, uh, the significant impact of the city is this. Um, we went from an average of about 114 traffic citations, I'm sorry, traffic collisions um, in total in 2015. We stayed uh, average with that in 2016 and 2017, right around the 100 traffic collision per year range. And this year alone, um, you see the reduction in traffic citations. We were sitting at 226 mm. traffic collisions within the city. Um, and that's collisions including uh, injury, non-injury, and fatal collisions within the city. So there's definitely a direct correlation mm -hmm. between traffic enforcement and traffic collisions. Um, so that's just one thing that I, I want to make you aware of. That those, those are the four positions we're looking at currently. If those, uh, if those positions or a portion of those positions were to be frozen, that's, that's what the trade-off is immediately. But they're not your patrol officers. One is a patrol position. Or one is a task force. I'm sorry. No, you're correct. They are not patrol positions. They are not patrol. One is a task force position. Uh, two would be what we would term a, a vice or a problem-oriented policing team, and one would be a traffic position. Mm. So, okay. Correct. So, I mean, and the traffic position might be very important, but, but your patrol officers are who I really worry about correct. probably more than any of the other ones, although there, there's a need for all of that, but you have to, we're going to have to gaze that need, I think, according to budget. Uh, understand. Um, so. Realize there's a trade-off. Um, so when, when we have officers, when we, when we don't have a traffic enforcement officer and we have the spike of over 100% in, in traffic collisions, we have our patrol officers responding to those calls for service that handle yeah. those, right. where primarily a traffic enforcement officer would handle those types yeah. of calls. And there's a cost to the city of any kind of traffic collision. Absolutely. There's danger to the public. There's all of those kinds of things that, that yeah, have to be factored in. And then the other thing to consider is the lack of um, asset sharing, the federal asset forfeiture funds, mm -hmm. by not having some of our task force positions filled. Okay. Um, you know, the city manager spoke about um, special revenues and some of the things that we're looking to purchase and to maintain mm -hmm. through the use of those, those special revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, without participation in those task forces, our ability to collect those funds or receive those funds is drastically reduced, if not limited in, um, entirely. We would, we would have to look at the amounts, I think, on that, though, Correct. If, if we have any kind of figures on that. Okay. Chief, just a quick overview. Um, how many sworn <coughs> total minus? So we have 34 sworn. That includes the one fully funded um, school resource position. So we have 33 out of the general fund. And that encompasses from my position all the way down uh, for sworn personnel. Right. And then um, typical uh, patrol, I know it varies from um, patrol staffing on a day-to-day -day basis. Is, is it kind of, again, as an overview, kind of review for council? You have sure. four on plus a sergeant. And That's an ideal minutes. situation, yes. Okay. Um, Keep in mind that, that one of the things that was mentioned is training. Yep. So we have um, mandated training by Peace Officer Standards and Training for the State of California yep. that's on a two-year cycle. We're currently finishing up our two-year cycle, so we're, mm -hmm. we're getting everybody through force simulations, through racial profiling, uh, through driving and um, slow speed maneuvering courses and everything that are required by the state. So that that's a reduction of our four officers down to three on some shifts. Uh, we try to maintain three and one as the normal. I would say two and one is, is the bare minimum, and that's dangerous um, in regards to our geographic location and the amount of time that it takes for medical clearance and booking at the, at the yep. county jail and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, and, and four and one is a, a, a comfortable level for us. Um, three and one or anything below that would be um, we're starting to push dangerous levels at that point. And, and Chief, there, there's a standard, right, a ratio about per population? There is. Um, um, what, what is it? Just so again. So it, it depends. And nobody meets it, is that right? It's, I, I it's hard to meet. Yeah. Um, usually you're looking at 1.25 officers per 1,000 residents. There are some flaws to that because that doesn't take into account geographic needs and calls for service within that, uh, within that community. Yeah. So there's, it's, it's controversial. Um, <coughs> I know fire services have a, a kind of a cut and dry formula. That's been the go-by for a number of years. Um, there is some documentation out recently that says that that's – um, either overstated or understated, depending again on the geographic uh, location and calls for service and needs of the community. I just had one. Um, yeah. You covered um, on the four vacant uh, what impact, you know, like with the uh, traffic position and the uh, patrol, what impact, and then the DA, obviously, we would risk getting the funding from federal funding. Correct. Uh, what impact would it have if we were not to backfill the vice? Uh, so positions. if we didn't have those positions, really what those positions in would be utilized for is to augment our investigative team and kind of a handoff between patrol and investigations. So when we have the calls from the community regarding the narcotics activities within the community, um, gang activity in a particular area, or the need for follow-up on any type of major investigations, those officers would, it, would be there to augment patrol and investigations and, and provide those services. 
without those officers there, our investigators are having to work overtime and our officers are going to have to pick up some of the slack in addition to their normal duties. So that mm -hmm. takes them out of call rotation. That adds to uh, calls for service for the other officers and it, and it uh, leads to delayed response times for not emergency situations. And without going into specifics, we have probably have plenty of gang and that type of activity. We're right? not immune from some of those problems, correct. Okay. Thank you. You know, if you could, Rosanna, uh, thank you for the information. Um, if we can jump forward just a little bit to the vehicle maintenance shop. I know that you brought it up before um, with respect to, uh, you know, the, they obviously build the departments for the work that they perform. Um, how that impacts the general fund and, <coughs> and uh, looks, I mean, I know we've talked about outsourcing that entirely because a lot of the work, I think probably three quarters of the work is outsourced or maybe not quite, at least two thirds. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So um, I really want to encourage council to, th to think of these as two separate topics. So it's two different funds, but have some intermingling in that the charges to the general sure. fund are part of the operation of the maintenance right. fund. Um, but there really are some big picture elements that are worthy of uh, further attention. So Fund 601, which you'll find in your book on the revenue and expenditure side, uh, it's an internal account. Um, there are three kind of subcategories to it. There's vehicle maintenance, grounds and facilities, and uh, not risk management. There's one other small item, and I'm sorry, I'm, it's escaping me for the moment. But for the, the purposes of today, I really want to focus on the bulk um, subject matter, which is the vehicle maintenance shop. Um, why do we have a shop? Uh, historically, it's been very valuable to the city to have control of repairs, uh, assessing, repairing, and getting uh, work completed and back in the hands of employees as equipment. Um, as our operations have evolved, and our fire apparatus have changed. Um, we've transitioned from a facility that had firefighters that performed a lot of the mechanic duties uh, to a shop that managed many of them. And uh, in recent years, our personnel have become certified in uh, mechanic uh, needs for firefighting equipment. Um, they have also been very instrumental in addressing a number of uh, the LAMS bus that, that circulates countywide. Um, when the, uh, the shop is unable to address the repair needs themselves, it's outsourced. The activity is outsourced. So we're, there's another uh, slide that's going to show you exactly what that breakout is. And um, at this time, we have um, in, in many parts of the city a, uh, a younger fleet. Mm -hmm. um, but in some, some other parts of the city that are general fund supported, a very aged fleet. So Parks and Rec tends to have the much, much older vehicles that if we can salvage an old uh, truck out of streets and utilities, it gets sent over to, to Parks and Rec. It's, it's rare for Parks and Rec to have a, a new vehicle. It was like me growing up with pants, man. I had to like, hand me down. you know, hand me down to hand me down to hand me down. So <laughs> all kinds of lines were uh, faded, you know what I mean? Right right right. I know, that's true. So fun because ball. this fund <laughs> is supported by charges to other parts of our city operations, whether they're water, sewer, streets, uh, general fund, uh, when the, the fleet is younger, there are yes, less repair needs. And uh, when the, the fleet is younger, there's also the added benefit of some items being subject to warranty work. And so I want to be sure that I temper any of my remarks about uh, running in the red with the fact that our many of our police cars has, have been replaced in recent years and a number of our very large pieces of equipment, uh, let's say the water and sewer vac truck, I'm sorry, the sewer vac truck, for instance, we uh, replaced that aged piece of equipment along with many others that were 20 and 30 years old. And so we have fewer repair needs um, associated with them in recent years. The carryover balance for, for the fund um, is intended for equipment replacement as well as grounds and facilities maintenance. And you may recall 
that uh, when we had a budget adjustment needed to address Volunteer Park, it came out of the, the maintenance fund. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's, it's a place for, and, and looking back, you know, it's a place for deferred maintenance uh, to, to, to put money away so you can address your grounds and facility needs, which is what we've been shortchanging with the goal of trying to have the highest level of service today. We're not uh, kind of uh, factoring for replacement needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some key observations. Um, in recent years, we've seen a reduction in in-house work orders. More things are going out to be performed. Mm -hmm. And um, in a 16-month study period that I could readily access, um, and that, that's the reason it's being used, I can go greater uh, um, as requested, uh, we have an average of 53 repair hours per month that are being performed. So uh, think about your traditional mm -hmm. work week and two people. Yeah, uh, 80 hours a week and only 53 work hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the whole month? Yeah. Okay. So this next slide, I know it's a lot of numbers, but the short of it is I'm trying to show, uh, with Rose's help, um, the total amounts that are outsourced versus city shop. So in 1516, 433,000 was outsourced. Wow. City shop performed 182,000. For a total expense incurred for repair services of 615,000. And then you can see what happens uh, the next year, a major reduction, um, uh, well, a significant reduction in, in um, the city shop related component versus uh, the outsourced. And again, that number is hovering just above 600,000. And in 1718, which we're working to close out in its entirety, um, you see a little bit of an uptick in the city shop component, uh, but it's still a significant number in the outsourced and in the half a million dollar uh, range. And mm -hmm. in general, just One third. the majority of the repair for the last three years has been outsourced. And that the nature of it is based on um, whether it's a fit for an in-house activity. Uh, equipment and vehicles have become more sophisticated where there's control over who can do the repairs and, and less mm -hmm. ability. And warranty time. work, I imagine, all those sorts of things. Okay. So um, the next slide in, intends to capture total expenditures, which I probably should have bolded, but it's uh, uh, the first uh, cluster, it's bottom line item. Mm. Um, and then the total revenues, and the revenues are a function only of charges for service. So you can see that every year, in order to maintain a shop of our own and have the convenience and control of timing, it's costing us a considerable amount of money that the maintenance fund is absorbing. So it's not being charged to anybody, it's, it's riding on the tails of the maintenance fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rosa was kind enough to do some projections um, for 1819, and this is the direction we think it's going. Um, it's like a quarter of a million dollars. Right. Time will tell, but mm -hmm. yes. So bottom line, charges do not support the cost of the operations. Okay. Mm. Now maybe I've had some really uh, strong debates with Guillermo about whether it would ever fully absorb the cost of operations because timing and convenience have a price, price associated right, with them. But I, so I want to make sure I'm fair to that topic because there's a reason the configurations uh, was established for the city of Raleigh. <coughs> Rosanna, yes. by outsourcing, what's an example of that? Is it dealership work or is it uh, no, local uh, mechanic, maintenance yeah, shops? Can you or? give me the name of a vendor that you might hmm. use for I can imagine is it farmers? I mean, big farmers. Yeah. It's like any welding work, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Empire? Yeah. All those yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I figured. But, uh, okay. And the Lambs vehicle was, um, the engine was replaced by, by a, a local contractor. Do you remember the name of the company? That, I'm just trying to get an idea. Yeah. Okay. And, and so there's a little bit of what we might Beyond. save. Yeah. Also, what, you know, is there full retail? I don't know what we're charging ourselves. I'm going to talk know, a little bit okay. to that right. because I think they're uh, artificially low, and there's probably a history to why that is okay. because of the general fund incurring so many of those expenses. Okay. So this slide in, intends to break down the charges overall and kind of where the burdens are. So from a, from a fleet point of view, 
Think of um, uh, most, we don't uh, have vehicles for anybody other than, excuse me, uh, parks and maintenance personnel, our um, streets personnel, uh, engineering division has a shared resource. Uh, building uh, building division and code enforcement code enforcement sharing right now <laughs> with public works um, and then we have the large equipment that is deployed for various uses and charged back let's say if we are I think someone told me they saw down at Kettle Call Arena the vac truck and they're uh, pumping the or clearing the septic system down there so that that would be charged uh, for the wastewater uh, related need um, but the bottom line is what this slide is showing you is that overall uh, the majority of the expenses incurred are borne by the general fund. Mm -hmm. yeah. Streets needs, you'll see in fifteen sixteen, it looked like we had a quite a bit of charges to that cost center for gas tax from the streets and utilities universe. Okay. Mm -hmm. One question uh -huh. um, with respect to the vehicle maintenance shop. So um, I understand, uh, you know, the, the, the charges for service and, the, you know, the difference is about a quarter of a million dollars estimated for 2018, 2019 from that shop. But what would that necessarily translate to if we were to outsource the work? So, Right. So the, the unknown, because we haven't gone out for an RFP, mm -hmm. would be establishing a set rate, rate schedule mm -hmm. for needs mm -hmm. and for a general repair services mm -hmm. and then you'd, we'd still have specialized service needs mm -hmm. right. that would be a function of what the piece of equipment what the failure was or um, so it is an unknown as to what we could secure as a rate schedule but uh, Guillermo was kind enough to provide me with some historical documents on the rates that were used and I, I think they're they're interesting in that um, there was some comparison done in 2008 and 2017. Our flat rate um, <coughs> in the city of Raleigh um, for cars and light trucks is $85 per hour. Um, for medium heavy uh, medium vehicles, heavy trucks, construction equipment, fire trucks, it's $95 per hour. And then um, at that time in 2017, uh, city staff went out and uh, inquired of hourly rates of various uh, operators that are out there. So um, let's say, for instance, um, David and Son said it's a flat rate, depends on the repair. Dion International said $127 per hour. Um, Desert Auto Chevrolet uh, said $115 per hour. Empire, $111 and $11 per hour for construction, construction equipment. $120 for trucks. Service calls are $147 per hour. Uh, Daniel's Tire Center, $100 per hour. Stiff equipment, oh, I'm sorry, that, that one is missing the hourly rate. Torrance's Farm Implements, $85 per hour in shop. $100 per hour for service calls. So, so if we raised our rates, would they be closer to break even? I mean, I, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, we're not I, playing it, the internal numbers game. It is possible yeah. that, it, but but then so you just would bill, you're just right. billing you're the billing general fund even more. Yeah. Yeah. The general yeah. fund more so, that yeah, so it hurts us even more. Yeah. Right. And then but the hours efficiencies, I guess that's yeah. what I was going to yeah. you know, yeah. back up on, and I know that's probably been explored, you know, I would assume multiple times, but... Um, I, I do have one question about the expenditures. Is is this including warranty work, the value of the warranty work that's being done for free, or this is truly dollars spent, not, not counting The warranty, warranty work. work is not included. Okay. All right. Yeah, so this is actual cost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure there wasn't going to be this steep right. drop-off once the warranties expire on equipment that's all been bought about the same time. Well, as in any with any of us who have a new car, the question always is at year five or whatever your warranty period is, year three, is the big repair mm -hmm. going to hit, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. So it is a bit of a, um, a, a guess, a numbers game as to whether or not. Um, I, th I think the, the question yeah, for the city to consider is whether the timing and convenience yeah. are important enough to run the cost center at a loss. 
Right, of a quarter of a million dollars a year. And at the trajectory that we're on is to zero out the maintenance fund. We're, right. we're not far from reaching that within six years, five years. I'd have to look at the numbers. Once again, I think our, when I looked at our fund balance at the close of 1617, we were at 1 1.5 million. And that's, uh, that's where we get money to pay for equipment that's not, uh, to pay for new equipment that is not some other fund or, or grant monies or whatever. Correct. Mm -hmm. So if we were to change um, the way in which we address vehicle maintenance, I think there's a few ways to skin um, the cat. One is, first of all, I think we need to study it a little bit further mm -hmm. and come back to you with a complete evaluation. Um, there could be options to totally outsource or what I see as a recommendation, at least for the fiscal year, would be a hybrid ap approach. So we would look at a potential reduction in force mm -hmm. by 50 percent, try to get uh, an RFP out mm -hmm. and begin to set up a structure that can be successful. I do not want to underrepresent that by having it in-house, we have a hub that cares for all of our fleet needs. Right. And just dumping it back on the departments to say you're on your own, good luck, isn't going to work. Yeah. Right. So but but if we limit what, and and I'm not sure how the maintenance shop works exactly, but mm -hmm. if if it's determined that they will only do oil changes, air filter changes, certain things, right, mm -hmm. and the rest of any work is outsourced, then that may be another way to to help reduce the cost that they're charging as well, you know, and so it just we have to look at that carefully. But I'm certainly aware that. We've had the discussion, and I'm 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 open to the fact that it may be less expensive for the city overall to outsource um, some of that work, a bigger portion, really. Yeah. Yeah. Bec well, if you think about what it the the time and convenience, what it costs us is anywhere from we've really slowed we very much slowed activity in 1718, mm -hmm. but um, you know we hover between three and four hundred thousand. Well, as high as 440. But mm -hmm. I guess my question yeah. would be too is you have to kind of factor in if they have to take that vehicle to El Centro mm -hmm. for service, and they have to and you need to put an employee in there that transports that vehicle. They're already charging for that time. Then, yeah, then these guys cost, charge. See, what's your cost there? Because charge us. Yes, mm -hmm. they charge us for that. They but, charge but ourselves. <laughs> if you don't have that service, what what employee do you use to do that? That. That might create some if we retained one of two positions or that let's might, say recast a, a single position, right. you still start. end up with a considerable cost savings because the cost here is not only – wages is a significant portion of it, but it's also setting up the shop to run. Yeah. And yeah, there's mobile right. services too yeah. that can, yeah, you know, right. and we it's not like the shop isn't there. I mean, they could potentially use the location. I'm not sure if that's, right. you know, but that it's might be something too. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, but that, that was. Mm -hmm. you gotta look at all that. Are there two staff in the maintenance shop? Yes, right now? it used to be staffed with three, no, uh, and uh, we had a person depart mm -hmm. for a different part of the state of California. <coughs> we did go out to recruit mm -hmm. twice. We weren't mm -hmm. successful in finding mm -hmm. a skilled individual mm -hmm. um, to move forward with. And when we looked at the workload, it didn't well, appear that it right was sure. necessary at that juncture to press ahead, and I asked Shirley to slow any recruitment effort and focus on other areas because we had already gone out twice and we were functioning yeah. okay yeah. with less personnel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing mm -hmm. is not warranted, but we might contract with a local mm -hmm. provider and then, you know, we go from there. Okay, so I, I know I have mentioned uh, this particular area to the council before, and I wanted to be sure it's probably a little bit more numbers than you want to see for today's discussion, but it is, um, the intent was to... It's to good information. Very good, yeah. All right. Okay. So next steps. I, I, the discussion along the way was extremely helpful to hear what you have an appetite for and what you don't. Um, when we last uh, visited on this topic um, with council, the goal was to have a check-in conversation today and a final budget for adoption on November 20th. It sounds like you want to be more heavily um, involved 
but before we're to final. So would it be appropriate to have another date in between now and November 20th? I think that's a possibility. Is anybody here? Possibly. Is it open? Are you all open? Or are you, you going to be out of town? Or I, I think I am open. I'm open. I'm out of town next next week. All of next week, or is um, it? I'm here on Monday. And I may do with this Veterans Day. And yeah, yeah Monday Veterans. Day. I don't think it'll give us enough time to yeah, prep numbers. Yeah, it wouldn't, right? Anyway, so Friday. What about I'll be the night? Friday. Well, no, the 20th is when we have a regular meeting. Yeah. Yeah, we're back to a regular meeting. Yeah, you said you're 13. back on Friday. I'm back on Friday, and if that would help, I don't know. You guys want to have a meeting on Friday I early? could do a Friday how about, afternoon. How about see. Saturday night at 9? No? <laughs> Friday afternoon. Sure. <laughs> Friday afternoon. Or Friday. <laughs> There's popcorn. Friday sometime, I guess, is possible. Uh, I could do after. Uh, uh, after Sam's like going to show up in a Snuggie. Does it matter the Snuggies? Yes. Hey, man. Don't make fun of Snuggies. At the don't make fun of that. Snuggies. <laughs> no, no, you're not here the 13th. I could do a 2 the 13th? You'll be gone here. Um, yeah, I'll be gone. Okay. Okay, so is there a need to have a discussion? Uh, considering okay, so here's another way that we, we could approach. You could do that, or I could basically employ every strategy identified here and present a budget to you. Why don't we do that? Uh, and if it's greater than a million dollars, in, a million dollars in savings. Remember, for these cost recovery strategies, there's a bunch of pieces that would have to be put in place in order to realize yes. savings. Right. Yeah. And we're already going to be halfway through the year, yeah. so really at six months of recovery. Um, if it ends up in excess of the million dollars, then I could bring back to council to test the waters. What's your highest priority to bring back? Is it a police officer? Is it? I think that would be, yes. uh, you know, from what you've presented, I don't see, at least from reading the rest of council, I don't see that there's any opposition. Um, uh, other than the fact that, you know, we considering closing this facility, this building, but everything else I think we, we have to really okay. consider yeah. at this okay. point. So, okay. Is there any okay. objection to that from anyone? I no. think that's where no, we're at at this point. Can we discuss it and then decide? Yeah. I think I, I will just say two things. Uh, with Measure W, you know, that it was it was a challenge anyway because people are saying, you know, okay, so they're they're increasing the cost of, of doing business, so we expect to maintain or increase the levels of service that we currently have. So we, we just have to be aware, I'm sure, that, that there will be some pushback. Anything that's related to Measure W services or the services that those were supposed to cover will probably get pushback from the public on that. I'm, I'm okay with that. This, these are difficult times. We've got to make difficult decisions. The other thing, um, and I I'm not speaking for everyone, by, but I think it's it's probably foregone that we understand that every one of these decisions that, that affects individual employees affects their lives, affects their livelihoods and the way they provide for their families. And we're not trying to be flippant or take that lightly. We understand this is these are big decisions for, for a lot of people. And it's, again, difficult times, and we're having to make some difficult decisions. Yeah, no, certainly it goes without saying. But uh, l let's just get the information in front of us and um, yeah. and and really take a very close, hard look at it. But I think uh, you've done a ton of work on this, and it's not. I, I know the type of work that you do, Rosanna, and the staff does as well. And I know there's been a lot of consideration, and and you know, not just the personnel affected um, or that could be affected, but everything else and the public as well. You know, so um, I certainly appreciate the the work you've put into it. So, R Rosanna, could you bring, when, when we do come back for the f final, um, just where the summary for the purpose of council and I think and the public, of course, where it's kind of ranked and wh what are the biggest impacts? I mean, there's some of these things, again, they vary on dollar amount and savings. So by doing A, B, and C, here's where 50% of our potential savings come from and those may be very difficult topics I don't know I'm not even going to be specific about that but just in some descending order and the, the reason why I bring that up is some of these including some of the temp workers we might see that they're toward the bottom of the funnel and, and go hey well maybe we can live with this um, so it's just kind of the, the, the high impact 
What if we did kind of a matrix of each Would one of these helpful? alternatives or, I mean, just, with the I mean, dollar overall dollar it. value that's that fine. we end up landing? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but that's I mean, good. in some form, not yeah. not in detail, just yeah. just high level of here's where the bulk of the savings and come really from, the folks general fund. It, 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 absolutely. Because the the presentation for overall budget is recapping all the projects that you've also you're also authorizing. Right. And I don't know right. if you don't want to see that on the twentieth or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless we it's meet earlier, then, unless we meet earlier on the 20th, I don't think there's a lot going on, but I mean, yeah. we could meet earlier and not have to get out of here at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Or do you want to use <laughs> yeah. the 20th as a, a pivot point for the, whatever the first meeting date is in December? Or that's another. We could do that, or we can meet at 4 o'clock on, on the 20th. Meet earlier on the 20th. In a dock. Or 3 o'clock on the 20th. We could. Um, would you be open to g visiting here at, at 2 o'clock again, or? Three o'clock or four o'clock or mm -hmm. something sooner? Yeah. Sure. I am. I think three. Would two? Three? three? I, I think I would. What about three twenty-two? Three, simply <laughs> because there may be some other things going on on Tuesday in the day, daytime, but but Call three o'clock. Three, three o'clock. Three o'clock. Gives us a couple more. Three o'clock. Okay. Time to rock. Right. Right. Cool. That gives us extra. Three o'clock. Okay, change it to yeah. three o'clock. So we'll do that then, right? All right. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you. And thank you. So. Um, there is a closed session item that's a public employee evaluation for the city manager. Do we want to have that conversation? I know it's it's part of the budget discussion probably. Yeah. Okay. Let's have that. We'll, we'll take a three-minute break and then go back into closed session. Thank you all very much. <laughs>